Yesterday upon the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. The man at the bar said to me, nursing a fresh two fingers worth of kettle vodka in a tumbler he cradled between his thick, calloused fingers. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how wish he'd go away. I answered, drawing his sleepy but surprised gaze from the basin of his drink. Annie Ganish by William Hughes Mearns. That's what you were quoting, right? He studied me for a moment as if seeing me for the first time and trying to size me up. Most of the terminal drunks who typically dragged their sorry carcasses into the tavern this time of night amused themselves by ogling my tits or hitting me with slurred promises of unimaginable sexual pleasure. Not this guy. John was his name. His first name, anyway. Or at least that's what he told me. I didn't know his last one. Didn't really care. When he said nothing, I rolled my eyes and turned away, grabbing beer mugs off a drying rack by the sink beneath the bar and mopping beads of residual water away from a hand towel. Forget it, I muttered. Why try to carry on an intelligent conversation, much less a literary one, with someone who pretty much polishes off a fifth of vodka all on his own, all in less than two hours. What's your name? He said. Mel, I replied, short for Melanie. No one calls me that except my dad. He'd asked me this before, and I'd answered him the same. I waited to see if there was any dawn of recognition in his face at the words. Wasn't the least bit of surprise when there wasn't. You drink, Meg? He asked. He called me Meg every time, too. I held up the mug in one hand, the towel in the other, gave both demonstrative little shakes. Not while I'm on duty. I didn't tell him I never drink because my old man was a drunk, and even though I'd been clean and sober for seven years now, once upon a time, he liked to get into the pap's blue ribbon and then slap me and my mother around for shits and grins. I had never tasted alcohol. I worked in the bar so I would never forget it. The hot stink of booze on his breath, and how much I hated him still for that. John nodded once, fingering his glass again, and tossed back the entire dollop in a solitary swallow. That's good, he told me. His gaze wandering distantly toward a nearby pale water ring stained into the top of the bar, I wish I had never started. Maybe then, they'd leave me alone. I glanced around the pub. It was a Tuesday, almost midnight, almost closing time, besides John on his bar stool perched before me. The place was pretty much empty. A couple of kids with greasy hair and too many crude tattoos to have earned them any place but prison loafed in a far corner, shooting pool and drinking beer. They had one girl between them, a bleached blonde in too tight denim miniskirt who didn't seem to mind the two to one odds. Figuring, what the fuck, I had nothing better to do, I took the bait and walked back over to John. He had that cast in his eyes, a tone in his voice that my chronic drunks sometimes affect when they want to get nostalgic or wax reposodically. Maybe. Who would leave you alone? I asked. Probably his family, his old lady and kids. He was wearing a wedding ring. Old ladies, kids, and chronic alcoholism seldom mix company amicably. He looked at me. The periphery people. I blinked at him, wondering if I'd heard him right. The who? Still, he studied me his gaze unwavering, surprisingly steady in fact, giving the amount of booze he'd been knocking back that night. Periphery people, he said again, pronouncing the word slowly, carefully, as if each was a delicate crystal vase he was trying to swaddle a newspaper before packing away in a box in the attic. Although, they're not really people, not like you and me. I don't know what the hell they are, he blinked, 
his eyes growing cloudy again, and he looked away. Meh, never mind, you can't see them. Again, because I had nothing better to do, and because I was actually caught off guard by both his poem quotation and his use of a functional vocabulary word not typical of the common lexicon, I leaned comfortably across the bar. Why can't I see them? Yeah, you have to be drunk, he replied. Or, at least, I do anymore. Didn't used to. I could see them just fine on my own when I was a kid. I think kids are more receptive to seeing them. They believe in things, you know? Like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. Or periphery people, I supplied and he nodded. The periphery of what? John flapped his hand, indicating the room. Here. There, everywhere, everything, they're always around, standing in the shadows, all along the edges. Hmm, the periphery, I said. Yeah, he lifted his glass to his lips, then realized he had no more vodka. So they're here, right now. As he set the glass down, I reached for the kettle bottle and topped him off. Yeah. Nodding to me in thanks, he took a small sip, smacked his lips appreciatively, and drank again. You said they weren't human. Well, what do they look like? He shrugged. They're tall, really tall, like seven or eight feet high. They wear cloaks, hooded cloaks, and the cowls cover their heads. Cloaks, cowls, periphery and poetry. I was beginning to wonder if this guy, John, wasn't your typical chronic drunk at all, but something more tragic. I made a show of glancing around, brows raised. There were plenty of shadow draped edges and corners in the dump where I worked. Not a one of them seemed to be harboring a seven foot tall giant hooded man with a cowl over his face. You can't see them he told me. Because I'm sober? Yeah, but they're hideous, he shuddered, though whether from his admittance or the drink, I wasn't sure. Their faces are flat. There's nothing there, no eyes, no nose, only a mouth, round and gaping, taking up almost the whole front side, ringed with Teeth, oh God, lots and lots of teeth, rows of them going backward down their throats, just like a shark. The color drained somewhat from his face, leaving him with a sort of putty-colored pallor. They like to eat, you see. Maybe it was the unspoken body language that seemed to suggest this poor son of a bitch was really buying the snow cone machine he was selling to the Eskimos. Whatever the reason, I found myself simply staring at him and fighting the urge to shiver. Eat what? I asked, my boys uncharacteristically small. His expression shifted, a growing grim. His eyes round and earnest. He whispered one word in his reply to me. Souls. I expected him to say human flesh, maybe even brains or perhaps spleen, appendix, right little toe. This, however, caught me by surprise. Souls, I asked. They latch on to the back of your head with their teeth. Then they wrap themselves around you make you carry them around like that while they glut themselves. Sometimes they take a little, sometimes they take a lot. Depends how hungry they are. The cracked vinyl seat covered beneath his ass creaked as he shifted his weight, pivoting to glance behind him. With a nod, he pointed out the menagerie a trio in situ playing pool. You see that girl over there? 
Yeah. Turning in the seat again, he leaned across the bar toward me, close enough for me to smell the vodka in his breath. One of them's feeding on her right now. I took another look, but saw only the blonde laughing, slapping away one of the guy's hands as he tried clumsily, vainly, to grope the generous outward swell of her ass. She looks okay to me, I said. Because you can't see it, and she can't feel it. Well, not yet anyway. But will she? John nodded. One day, yeah. She'll find out. She has cancer or AIDS or maybe she'll step off the curb at the wrong time and get plowed into by a bus. Or have a psychotic break and shove a 17 inch long butcher knife through her husband's sternum while he's sleeping one night. But not at first. That comes later. I've seen it. No. At first... She'll just be sad. Sad. I repeated this, brow raised. You ever feel like everything in the world's gone wrong? Like you can't do anything right? Like the world is nothing but a big pile of dog shit? And you're just a smear in the fecal matter taking up space? That kind of sadness, that kind of despair... That's what they leave you with once they've eaten enough of your soul. From there, it only gets worse. Because that sorrow, that unhappiness, it must smell good to them. Draw them somehow. They're always with you after that, like a pack of wolves fighting over you for their chance to latch onto your skull and drain you dry. I've been tending bar for a long time, for seven years, starting about the time my mother had died and my dad had first sworn on her deathbed that he'd go clean, and then had shocked the glorious ever-living shit out of me by sticking to that. I've heard a lot of stories, yarns woven by a lot of guys far more wasted and crazy and pathetic than John, but for some reason... I couldn't just bob my head and cock that condescending smirk that I usually reserve for someone shit-faced and rambling. The in one ear out the other look, I call it. They've fed from you, you know, he told me pointedly. I felt a chill steal down my spine, slithering and unnerving, like a live eel dropped down the back of my t-shirt. Managing a hoarse bark of laughter, trying my damnedest to sound dubious. I said, what? He nodded. Well, how can you tell? His eyes found mine, round, sorrowful, nearly sheepish. You knew the poem. You haven't always been a barmaid. Normally, that antiquated and decidedly misogynistic term, barmaid, might have made me bristle. But this time, instead, it only sent another of those unpleasant little tremors racing down from the nap of my neck towards my ass. No, I said in slow admittance. I was a teacher. English literature in high school. World Civilization, he said by way of introducing himself an ex-career fellowship at the university, had tenure and everything. We studied each other for a long, quiet moment. Something happened, he said. Something that changed you. Maybe a moment you can't quite put your finger on or remember, but it's there. And in that moment, whether you knew it or not, part of your soul was gone. My mother died, I said. My dad's on disability. He can't get around. I have to be home in the daytime with him. There's no one else who can take care of him. Feels like your life's being sucked right out of you sometimes, doesn't it? John asked, and when I nodded, hesitant, the corners of his mouth hooked in a brief, bitter smile. 
because it is. A glance beyond my shoulder, split second but pointed. There's one behind you right now. I whirled, eyes wide, but saw only rows of liquor bottles and cocktail glasses lined up dutifully along the shelves. It's not feeding, he continued. Not yet, anyway, but it wants to, and there's only one way to stop it. How? I asked. As ridiculous as this whole thing sounded, I couldn't help but believe him. There was such a tremendous, sorrowful sincerity in his voice, in his eyes. It was as if all the booze had been wiped from his system, and he was sober again. Brutally. Helplessly so. He leaned toward me. You have to see them. His hand draped against mine, his skin dry and warm. If you can see them, they'll leave you alone. Another fleeting, humorless smirk. No sport in it for them. As he drew back his hand, he shifted on his stool again, letting his feet fall heavily to the floor. I shook my head as if snapping out of a trance. For the first time, I realized... We were alone in the bar. The trio of pool players, along with their invisible soul-sucking new friend, had left. You ever see movement out of the corner of your eye? John asked, fishing his wallet from his back pocket and dropping a pair of twenties onto the bar. His glass still had vodka in it, but he left it alone, turning with a shuffling gait for the door. A flash of shadow, maybe. Like something's there just beyond your field of sight. Only when you turn your head, it's gone. I nodded, and he said, that's them, the periphery people. He started to walk away, but paused when I said, what about you? You said something changed me, the moment where one of these things fed for me. What about your moment? What changed you? He looked over his shoulder at me, and this time, when he smiled, it was something melancholy and lonely. His lips pursed, then parted, as if he meant to speak. But then he must have thought better of it because he closed them again, still shuffling the palsied gait of a man far older than his years. John turned again and walked away, leaving the bar without another word. I locked up behind him, the heavy sound of the deadbolt sliding home as I turned the key as sharp and loud as a gunshot. I tried to laugh it off, to tell myself he was just a crazy drunk, that he'd been spewing vodka-infused bullshit he wouldn't even remember come the morning. But then, as I started to turn away from the door to face the bar again, I thought I caught a glimpse of something reflected in the glass, a looming shadow directly behind me, standing just along the peripheral edge of my vision. With a startled gasp, my heart jackhammering in sudden, bright fear, I whirled around, pressing myself back into the door. I was alone, at least to my sober eye. There's one behind you right now, he told me. It's not feeding. Not yet, anyway. But it wants to. I thought of how he described them, their ghoulish mouths ringed with teeth so that they could latch on and hold tight. Again, I wanted to dismiss it and him as utter bullshit, and again, I couldn't suppress an uneasy shiver just the same. There's only one way to stop it, John had told me. You have to see them. I returned to the bar and stood beside the seat he'd only recently vacated. His last shot of kettle remained where he'd left it. And I reached for it now, lifting the glass in hand, giving it an experimental sniff. I'd never tried vodka before. Had felt neither the urge nor desire to drink myself into a stupor. If you can see them, they'll leave you alone. No sport in it for them, then. Bracing myself, I drew the glass to my lips, tossed my head back and swallowed. Having drained it dry, I leaned forward, 
poured another and downed it, then a third, then a fourth. And after the fifth, as my mind started to grow murky, and the shadows in every corner of the room seemed to grow elongated and sinister somehow before my eyes, becoming nearly human in shape, creeping closer to me, slowly, but surely. I took a seat on the bar stool and waited to see. I was home alone on a Tuesday night. It was spring break and, despite all the things my parents wanted me to do, go to the mall with my friends, see a movie, and catch up on my reading, I had nothing really going on. For the past five days, I spent my free time sitting in front of the TV and drawing my favorite Marvel superheroes. Well. Tonight was different, I'll say. As usual, I was watching comedy shows and drawing my favorite characters and the people I shipped them with. My dad was on a business trip for the next two days and my mom was running what she liked to call late night errands. Before she left, she had asked me if I wanted to come. I told her no because, well, I just didn't want to go. I was a kid and I thought watching TV was more exciting than waiting in line for groceries or a package. It was around 11pm when I started wondering why my mom wasn't home yet. Usually, she would have been home about two hours ago, telling me to go to bed because it was, and I quote, too late for a 15 year old to still be up at this hour. Not that I would have gone to sleep right away. I'd probably be on my phone for the next hour or so or until I got tired or bored. But right now, my mom was not here to tell me what to do. If we had been keeping track of how long it would take my mom to shop, this would have been a new world record. Then the garage door opened. Huh, about time I thought. I was actually tired at this point and was kind of hoping my mom would arrive soon, that I wouldn't fall asleep. Then my mom would have to find a new way into the house. I remember ever since I was 10, my mom would leave me home alone, and whenever she got home, I would walk to the door that led to our garage and wait for the engine on her car to turn off before unlocking and opening the door for her. I got up from the couch and drudged toward the door. I quietly listened for the engine to hum and then get cut off. I listened for my mom's high heels to click toward me, quietly at first, but gradually getting louder. But when I stopped to listen, all I heard was silence. It was like I had gone deaf instantly. I heard nothing in my house or outside of the garage. No engine, nothing. Not even my mom's clicking high heels sounded behind the locked door. Charlie? I heard her voice on the other side. I was relieved. Please unlock the door. What's the secret passcode? I asked, <laughs> grinning like a madman. Charlie, she said again, please unlock the door. Wrong. I laughed and I began unlocking the door. We had five locks on our garage, front and back door. My mom liked playing it safe when it came to leaving her only child home alone. The correct answer was, Charlie, please. Unlock the door. Why do you keep saying that? I froze where I stood, keeping my fingers on the third lock. This was a little weird. My mom has never even spoken to me through the door. And why was she repeating the same thing to me? Are you okay, mom? I asked her through the door. 
Charlie, please unlock the door. The way she said my name was the creepiest part. After hearing it four times, it started to sound like an echo. In fact, by the fourth time, Charlie didn't even sound like a name or a word anymore. I took my fingers off the third lock and backed away from the door. It was still quiet in the house, but the further I backed away, the more my name seemed to echo from the garage. Charlie, please unlock the door. Charlie, please unlock the door. Charlie, please unlock the door. I wanted to scream. I wanted to open the door and stab whatever was on the other side with a knife. Have I gone crazy? I thought, holding my head in my hands out of annoyance and the massive headache I had just gotten. I wanted it to end. I hadn't even been... It hadn't even been going on for five minutes and already... The front door opened. I was about to cry out like a frightened five-year-old girl when I heard a familiar clicking noise. My mom was home. I ran up to her. She was gently setting their groceries down on the floor and preparing to take her coat and shoes off. I embraced her before she got the chance. What's the occasion? She asked me. I'm just, I'm glad you're home, mom, I said crying a little with my face buried deep in her coat. Did you watch that don't be afraid of the dark thing again? She asked with concern. No, it just, just the bunny man massacre. You know, I hate it when you watch those things right before bed. She let go of me, slipping off her high heels. As a matter of fact, you should go brush your teeth, slip on your PJs and head to bed. I nodded, but I did want to read a little before bed, so I went to the family room to get my book from my backpack. I couldn't wait to just sit in bed for another 20 minutes and just read my new book. It was always my way of ending another day. And then I looked outside. Our driveway was invisible in the black of night except for the basketball hoop that stood off towards the side of our lawn. But usually, if something was in the driveway, we would be able to see its shape. And this time, there was no car. The realtor still wouldn't look me in the face as he held the keys out to me. I couldn't blame him. Most people were put off by the lines etched across my face. Suppose most think I'm some kind of zealot or some such. I didn't give a shit what most people thought. The tattoos would serve their purpose. I shifted the duffel bag higher onto my shoulder and accepted the keys. So, Mr. Stokes began the realtor. Everything is in order, and the place is all yours now. Real steel at the price you got it. You know, I was going through the paperwork and realized the family name Stokes used to own the place almost 20 years ago now. I know, I replied. Relatives. I also knew why I got such a great deal. I'm sure he did too, but damned if he was going to mention it couldn't risk blowing the sale. There were no worries there. I was going to be the last person this place ever owned. My hand tightened around the keys. I could feel the house, like cold fingers wrapping around my spine. I knew they were watching, and that was okay. That was all they could do since it was early morning. 
and I know they only come out at night. Well, I guess I'll get out of your hair and let you get settled in, said the realtor. Thank you, Mr. Boone, I replied. Guess the movers will be here soon, he said. Out with the old and in with the new, eh? I suppose. I wasn't moving anything in, or out for that matter. The previous tenants left everything behind. Of course, where they moved to, you really can't carry it with you. Boone shook my hand, his eyes drawn to the Latin script scrawled across the back of my knuckles. I knew he wanted to ask what it meant. He didn't. He just smiled a half-hearted smile. Thought of me as just another freak whose money spent as well as anyone's did, and turned to walk out the door. Goodbye, Mr. Stokes, he said. I hope you enjoy the place. Goodbye, Mr. Boone. I'm sure I won't. I added silently. The door clicked shut behind him. I twisted the deadbolt home and pulled against the door to be certain. I slung the bag down from my shoulder, unzipped it, reached inside, and pulled out the nail gun. I started at the bottom and drove long, nail after nail through the door and into the frame. I stood in the living room, nail gun in hand, ready to start on the windows and I froze as my eyes found the staircase. My mind flashed back all those years ago, back to Marie. I could still see the blood and the strange angles her broken body made as it tumbled from the second floor down. I could still see her eyes staring open, her last act mouthing the word, run. It was the last thing my sister ever said. I shook myself out of the past and walked to the windows. I had so much to do before sundown, and I felt eyes on my back as I moved. The fireplace mantle was dotted with small porcelain people. Little milk-white, angelic boys and girls whose heads shouldn't be able to move, but turned to watch me nonetheless. I smiled and raised my middle finger. I made my way through the house upstairs and down, securing windows and doors, any way in or out. Memories haunted me again in the master bedroom. The bed rested in the same spot as my parents' bed had. I could see it in my mind's eye, the bed soaked with blood, my mother lying in a center with her chest flayed open, her head resting on the floor at the foot of the bed, and a horrible, rat-like thing picking at it like it was the last scrap of chicken on a bone. The rat thing looked at me, a snarl curling its lips. No, no, not a snarl. A smile. Want some? It asked. And I remember running for the stairs as my sister screamed. I looked over my shoulder as I reached the bottom step. Marie had followed moments behind me. As she set foot on the last step, the thing that would end her life seemed to peel itself from the wall behind her. It was tall and thin, like a skeleton covered in nothing but sagging, clammy skin. The thing had no face, just droopy, wet folds of flesh. Marie screamed again as it wrapped its arms around her, its long, thin fingers cutting into the flesh of her arms. It squeezed, and I heard my sister's bones snap. Blood bubbled from her mouth as it let go, and her shattered body fell. I did, as she asked me, and I ran for the door. My feet slid from under me as I skidded to a halt, my heart hammering in my throat. A woman stood, blocking the front door. She was nude and beautiful one hand caressing a full, firm breast. Recognition blasted through my pubescent mind. I knew this woman, this image. It was seared into my 13-year-old brain from a late-night cable channel movie my parents would have flipped out about if they'd known I'd been watching. My confusion turned to a scream as the skin of the beautiful face split down the middle in a gory red line. 
The bone of the skull cracked in a zigzag line and opened, the jagged shards like teeth in a gaping mouth. I scrambled to my feet, and I ran. My father, well, he died in the kitchen. He was blamed for it all, actually. A murder or suicide. My, my father, he, he didn't kill himself. I saw it all as I stumbled my way into the kitchen. My father was propped in a kitchen chair, his face a red, battered mess. And a man stood before my father, his back to me, and a shotgun in his hand. The man turned and smiled, showing a haphazard row of crooked teeth. My father's eyes looked out from the gaping, gore-rimmed holes in the man's face. The man reached toward my father's slack, broken jaw. He fished out a cracked tooth, opened wide, and jammed it into his wet, rotting gums. Then he pulled the shotgun to my father's head, and he pulled the trigger. I don't remember getting to my feet, or making it to the kitchen door, or, or running the two miles to the nearest neighbor. I don't remember what I told them, or what I told the cops after they were called. And I don't remember crying and racking sobs or pissing myself, but they said I did both. I don't know why I don't remember. Maybe shock had finally set in. I learned later that we weren't the first, nor the last. Almost everyone who ever lived in that house died violently. There were few exceptions, like myself. I researched back as far as I could, but I never found the root, the cause of all the death. I don't know, maybe some places are just evil. After what seemed like hours, I tossed the nail gun back into the duffel and sat down beside it. I was trapped, just the way I wanted it. I pulled the bottle of water from the bag and downed half of it in a gulp. I replaced it and took out a container of salt. I pour the salt in a six-foot circle, taking care to make sure the line is steady and unbroken. I remove all my clothes and sit cross-legged in the center, with my eyes closed. I need to be calm, centered. I rest and wait for night. I lose myself to sleep for how long I don't know. The noise wakes me. They're all there, all the demons from my nightmares just outside the salt. The man from the kitchen is blind once more. My father's lifeless eyes long since rotted away. He still smiles my father's smile, though. The woman of my wet dreams licks her lips seductively, her fingers pinching rosy nipples. Loose skin flops wetly, loose skin flops wetly, as the thing that killed Marie claws at air, unable to cross the salt line. The rat thing twitters and clutches the nude woman's leg, a long, pointed tongue flicking at her thigh. And there are the others that I've never seen, shadows with red eyes that breathe and writhe, hairless, apish things with pus-filled sores, a ghostly, pale woman with a dark red neck and slashed wrists, whispering things that seem to be all teeth. They hiss and spit out the salt and all the symbols inked beneath my skin. I research much more than the history of this place over the years. I stand and breathe deep, the cold prickling my bare skin. I wonder if they know what the symbols, the writing, really means. Time to find out. I reach my foot out and break the salt lines. The demons rush me, crashing into me like high tide, and I smile. They didn't understand. I feel their joy, then their confusion, as they touch me. The prayers and incantations inked to my flesh do their work. I feel them warp and stretch as their bodies and mind become one. 
and I scream as the legion invades me, trapped beneath my skin. My dream woman was last, her nails raking furrows into the wood floor as the spell sucked her in. I fall to my knees, struggling for control. I feel them all inside me, screaming to get out, battering themselves against the wards branded into my flesh. I crawl to my bag and reach for the small, red gas can within. I will die tonight, and with me, this house and its demons. I empty the can over my head, the acrid fumes of the gasoline forcing themselves into my lungs. I pull the lighter from my bag. I burn. I wake. The fluorescent lights sear my eyes and pain comes in a rush. I try to move but bandages swath my body. The pain worsens. A gray-haired, white-coated man looks down at me. Can you hear me, Mr. Stokes? He asks. My name is Dr. Montgomery. He shines a pen light into my eyes. You were in a fire, Mr. Stokes. I'm sorry to tell you this, but you have third degree burns over 95% of your body. You've got a long road ahead of you, Mr. Stokes. A deep, strong voice says, Oh, I'll be all right. My heart freezes. The words come from my mouth, but it is not my voice. Let me tell you a story about a place you know. You know, Barnum House. Everyone I ever talked to about it, they all knew the Barnum House. Most don't remember where or when, but they heard talk about it or saw the pictures or watched the documentary. And when I describe it, the large white doors, the high walls, the walls with flaking blue paint and the yard outside, always immaculate. Except for that one longish patch of dead plants. Then they remember. They see the picture again. And I bet right now you can see it. The old trees slowly moving with the wind. The wind whistling and howling past. And of course, that one top window shutter that keeps opening and closing. Opening and closing but not in the same pattern as the trees move where the wind whistles. The Barnum House. There are different stories about it. Some say the Barnum simply left from one day to the other. There was something they feared, and so they left without ever telling anyone. And that's why, if you look through the shutters and you're lucky enough to have enough light, you could see that there are still plates on the dinner table. Others say it was a burglary gone wrong. The police were called. There was a standoff. And he didn't want to give in. So the burglar shot the family and then himself. But I prefer the version, which my brother told me, that it was a murder-suicide about 30 years ago. The wife cheated or somehow otherwise displeased her husband. He got angry. Work trouble. Money trouble. He lost control. He screamed himself into a fury. The kids hid in that corner bedroom, and the wife was with him in the upstairs bedroom, clinging to his clothes and begging him to calm down. But he didn't calm down. He screamed more. He got angrier at her at the world and at himself and then he hit her he hit her until she stopped pleading and begging and whining and then some more at some point he calmed down and he saw the blood on his hands and clothes the blood all over the bedroom floor he saw the body of the woman he loved 
her hair drenched in red and her face not even recognizable anymore. And he knew that his kids would be taken and he would be locked up. He didn't want to live with knowing what he did. He didn't want his kids to live with knowing what their father did. So he took an axe and he went to the corner bedroom and he finished the job. And then he finished himself. His daughter must have been around 12. Dad broke through the door and she tried to protect her 8 year old brother. Screamed, begged, threw things. Tried. But her brother, Albrecht, he was there, in that corner, squeezed right next to the window, between the bed and the wall. He watched as his sister's head was cut in half like a log. And he cried, while his father stepped closer and closer, with anger and fear and pain in his eyes and an axe held high. Albrecht asked, why? But his dad never answered. He just raised his arm and slammed the axe into the head of the person he loved the most in the whole world. Two, maybe three times. Then he went back to his wife, ran the axe all along his own arms and finally, holding it with both hands, he slammed the axe two times into his own throat. Two times, and then his arms failed. My brother heard that from a friend who heard it from another friend. You know, the Barnum house. You've seen a picture someday on a website with that one shutter swinging. Or you might have heard one of the stories above or some of the many others. But in our town, well, everybody doesn't just know the Barnum house. Everyone's seen it. It's not even five minutes from my place. If you ever come over, I mean, I could walk you there. You could see the shutter for yourself. But I'm not crazy. Not like my brother's friend's friend, Thomas. I used to walk past that place every morning and every afternoon. A huge garden. A gravel path down to the house. There was no gate, and yet I never saw anyone even step on that gravel path. It would have been the perfect place to meet with your friends and do crazy stuff, but be sure that no one would ever find out. A perfect place for drugs or crime or just a good scary party. But that path was always empty. And God, no, I would never have stepped on that path either. I'm all for urban exploring, but there are places where you could see and feel that Something is wrong. Well, Thomas didn't think so. He asked all of his friends whether they'd come along to explore Barnum House, and they all said no. So he went alone. Alone he stepped on that gravel path, and he sneaked around the house with a flashlight in his hand and a knife in his pocket. He wanted to break a window open to get in, but just out of curiosity. He tried the handle of the back door, and wouldn't you know it, it was unlocked. Thomas opened it, slowly, with the large flashlight in his hand like a club, and everything was empty and quiet, except for the wind, not even dust. He went inside, slowly and quietly. He made his way to the kitchen and saw a sink filled with dirty dishes and a stove with a pot that must not have been washed for 30 years. Knives and chopping boards and the open storage room revealed a large stack of cans and bags of rice and potatoes that he didn't dare to touch. He passed the living room and admired the perfectly set table, set for two, not for four. Dry flowers on the windowsill and an open recipe book lying on the seat of an old armchair. Thomas glanced into the guest bedroom. He looked at the door to the basement and put his hand on it, but something stopped him. He later said that the door handle felt too cold, and that was the only reason why he didn't go down into the basement. 
So he went upstairs instead. Upstairs. To where they died. You might also have seen a photo of those old wooden stairs. They were all over the press. Photos of those stairs are even used for some other murder cases. They become stock photos for creepy old stairs that the newspapers like to use. And Thomas went up those stairs. He said he felt them bending under his weight and that most of them gave off a groan when his feet stepped on them. He got upstairs and he saw the four doors. The open bathroom door to his right revealed all that there was to be seen. He thought about looking for a souvenir in there, an old perfume of the mist or the killer's shaver. But Thomas didn't feel relaxed. He was always that cool guy, open for anything, willing to go alone at night to buy another six pack, not scared to take a crap alone somewhere in the forest. But in that moment, alone at the top of the stairs in the Barnum house, Thomas wished for nothing more than a good forest. So he didn't hunt for souvenirs. But he couldn't just back out like that. He had to see it all. Thomas forced himself to take two steps forward towards the other door. The bedroom hand on the cold handle, slowly pushed it down, pushed the door open and there was light and still. He held the flashlight high, just in case. Thomas said he saw that the bed was messy and that there were dark stains on the floor around and on the bed. The sheets were still on the bed, clothes still thrown on a chair, a man's boot still lying in a corner and he stopped himself from going into the room because he heard something, something that was not the wind, something like a crying boy. Thomas closed the door just in case. He turned left towards the corridor that led to two doors, one left and one right. He stopped and listened and heard nothing but the wind, and he breathed, and he told himself just to calm down and he took slow, careful steps. He said he chuckled at himself for being so scared of a ghost story, and yet he clutched that flashlight tight, and his other hand felt for the knife. As if a knife can stop a ghost. No more sounds, just the wind, howling loud. And occasionally, from the room to his left, came the clatter of the shutter slamming shut. Thomas said the room to his left just felt boring. There was no reason to look inside. But he wanted, no, needed, to have a look to the one to his left. That corner room. Albrecht's room. He felt cold but calm. The door to his right felt safe. So he turned to the other door, glancing back towards the stairs in the bathroom in the distance. And he placed his hand on the door handle. A warm door handle. And he stopped, breathed, and just before he pressed it down, he heard the crying. Why? A boy's voice. Please don't. The boy, sobbing. Don't hurt me. And Thomas, 17, he was a tough guy, but he ran. Down those stairs and out the back door and around the house and back towards the street, screaming. When he got home, he grabbed his blanket and he rushed to the sofa next to his mom, wrapped his sweaty body and cried. But even when she asked, he didn't tell his mother why. He locked himself inside and rarely even went to school. He only told his friends about all of it a few months later. And those friends told their friends, like my brother told me. And Thomas, he fell apart. He still got his grades, but his mother had to pick him up from school, and he didn't go much elsewhere anymore. 
Thomas became a warning not to mess with the Barnum house. A warning that Albrecht was still there, waiting for an answer why he had to die. But that still lives on, but different now. Two years after Thomas went there, there was a group of drunk teens. A dare, and they went inside, smashed the table, sprayed each other with the Mrs. Perfumes, stood in awe, staring at the dark stains on the floor and bed. And then they went to Albrecht's room. They didn't hear anything, they just opened the door. And they found the body, dry as leather, of a seven-year-old boy. Naked, hands missing, with an axe still stuck in his skull. A boy that went missing two years earlier. Ever since I was a little kid, I grew up having the famous Girl Scout cookies in my life. My parents loved buying them, getting addicted to them from the first time they ever tried them. Their favorites were always Thin Mints and Samoas. I tried each kind once, never really having a favorite and instead preferring to stay away from the cookies in general. When I was about 15, my parents finally stopped buying the cookies. Mostly, it was because we never had enough money for them anymore, because the economy was becoming a chaotic mess. And it was also because they just outgrew eating them. I didn't mind much. I've been living on my own for about two years now, and during that time, every few months, Girl Scouts would come by to my house and ask if I wanted to buy any cookies. They always gave me the same sad-eyed look, trying to guilt me into buying a box or two. Usually, I'd be able to ignore their sad faces and not buy any. But this time, it was different. I don't know what came over me, but a strong urge to actually buy a few boxes got the best of me, and I gave a small nod to the girl in front of me. Sure, I said as I once again looked through the cookie brochure before folding it back up. I'll have a box of, um, Samoas and Thin Mints. Old habits die hard, right? All right, the girl nodded quickly, her pigtails bobbing along. A large grin was spread across her face, and it warmed my heart to see that. When she had finished writing down my order, she took my payment and happily skipped on her way to the next house. I knew that it took about two weeks for the delivery to actually be made, and when the boxes actually arrived, I was pleased. I signed for the boxes and went and sat down in the living room opening the Samoas first. The familiar scent of coconut and chocolate filled my nose, and I gingerly took one out of the container, slipping it into my mouth. It was one of the best cookies I'd ever eaten, and I realized they tasted so much better than when I was a kid. Odd how your taste buds do that to you, isn't it? I continued to eat the cookies, and within a few minutes, the whole box was gone. I hadn't been expecting that to happen. I brushed the crumbs off my lap and stood up, grabbing the now empty box and container and throwing them away. As I made my way back to the couch, I couldn't help but get an intense craving to eat the other box. This had never happened before but I just went with it, and soon enough, that box was gone too. I frowned in dismay, 
as I realized this, but once again, got up to throw away my trash. The next few days that passed were unusually hard. I was getting intense cravings for the Girl Scout cookies, and I couldn't find an exact reason why. They were just cookies after all, and I knew all the ingredients by heart. After all these years, the ingredients had never changed. So why now? I couldn't take it anymore. I ended up digging one of the boxes out of the trash and got the number from it, quickly typing the digits into my phone. There was a kind woman's voice on the other end. She helped me order, amazingly, a month's worth of cookies. A lot of money but worth it. I had to reassure myself that. The next few months, the cravings continued to grow worse. I continuously ordered more and more Girl Scout cookies, spending more and more money. After almost a year, I finally ran out of money to afford to pay for not only the next shipment of cookies, but for the rent of my house as well. I was kicked out after a week of being unable to make up the money I owed. I had become a completely different person. I was overly obsessed with the cookies, and I had to have more. Nothing was going to stop me. Even if I had to break into the place where they were made myself. And I decided that that was exactly what I was going to do. After getting directions from several people, I was finally able to make my way there. The place was more of a darker looking factory than I expected. The sky was dark and filled with smog, the air smelling like something burning and of death. I held my shirt over my mouth and nose to try to ignore the smell, but as I grew closer, the smell grew worse and I felt bile rise in my throat, burning. I bit it back and managed to scale the wire fence that surrounded the factory with ease. I landed easily on my feet and, after avoiding several puddles of what looked like muddy water and scattered droplets of something dark staining the ground, I finally found the entrance. Surprisingly, the doors weren't locked. No padlock, no chains, nothing. I was confused as to why this was, but I didn't question it. My stomach growling loudly, begging for me to find the delicious treats I'd wanted so badly. It was pitch black inside. I took only a few steps before I heard something clatter several feet away, and I froze, swallowing hard. There was a giggling in my ear, and I jumped. We knew you would come, said a cheerful and familiar voice. What? I managed to croak out as several lights were suddenly turned on. I blinked several times as my eyes grew adjusted and my heart almost jumped out of my chest at what I saw. All around me were not only large vats for the cookie dough, but also discarded pieces of human bodies. There was a small arm. It looked like a five-year-old's arm near my foot, and I felt my knees grow weak as I realized where the smell of death was coming from. Why all these bodies were here. The special ingredient that the Girl Scouts had always tried so desperately to hide. To keep under wraps was human body parts. I felt sick to my stomach then, but even knowing that, I still craved those cookies. We've been waiting for you. We really have. You're one of our best customers. A young girl stepped out of the shadows, and I realized it was the same Girl Scout who had sold me the cookies, who had gotten me into this predicament. But when I thought about it, it was my fault 
for even buying that first box. I shook my head and took a step back, only to realize that the exit had been barred. I felt my heart sink to my stomach as I realized my fate. The group of girls surrounding me, drawing closer with every step. I knew there was no escape. I never should have come here, never should have bought that box of cookies. I fell to my knees, finally accepting that I couldn't avoid this. I'm nervous as I walk up to the front door, reciting the words over constantly in my head. Sure, I could do this. It would be easy. I'd practiced so many times before. I could make the words flow. I rang the doorbell, and once it was opened, I asked, Hello, would you like to buy some Girl Scout cookies? It all started as a message in my mailbox one morning. Having my morning coffee and cigarette, I decided to walk out to the mailbox and check my mail. And I bought this house from an auction for a very low price. It was out in the quiet country, and me, being a city kid, I had no idea what country life was like until I had made a few friends around the area. With the purchase of the house came about a hundred acres of crop land that, in the autumn, blossomed into golden produce that swayed beautifully in the wind. I slipped on my shoes and headed out to the road, still slightly groggy, and upon opening the mailbox, I found a dead bird inside. Now, <laughs> at first, I thought it was those stupid kids playing pranks again, because last week, they decided to toilet paper my lawn. And I pulled the dead bird out and threw it on the ground. It was mangled to a pulp, almost as if a dog had gotten a hold of it. And inside was nothing. And I started to think that maybe the kids had stolen my mail, but eventually I brushed it off and told myself I'd get up early in the morning and watch the mail come so I could catch the jerks in the act. And the next morning came, and the mailman came as usual. I walked out and got my mail, not thinking anything of it. And the next morning was the same. The next week came, and I walked out to get my mail once again. This time, I was horrified at the sight. My white mailbox had blood smeared all over it. I opened the mailbox cautiously, and inside was a mangled cat. I gasped and covered my mouth, quickly choking back the vomit rising in my throat. I rushed to my garage, put on my gloves, and pulled the poor animal out. And stapled to it was a note, fairly legible but crude nonetheless. On the note was a simple smiley face. I was disgusted at that. Whoever did it thought it was funny. I gave the cat proper burial and continued with my day. The next morning, I woke up around 5 in the morning. I walked out and checked my bail box again to see if it had been tampered with. The cat I had just buried in my backyard was stuffed inside yet again. This time, another note attached to it. This one had a frowning face and written under it. You don't like my present? Well, I was pretty pissed off, and I was finally fed up. I decided to bury it yet again and stay up all night to watch my mailbox to find out who was doing this. The time rolled by, 12 in the morning, 1, 2, nothing at all. And then, at 3 a.m., I finally saw movement across the road, and out of 
of the cornfield, there came a figure into my yard. I watched it until it finally came under the security light I have in the middle of my yard. And what I saw, I cannot begin to explain. It was a man. Or at least, I think it was. It was hunched over like an old man with long, gangly arms that went further than the average human, and its head bent downwards, as if it was looking for something it had dropped on the ground. The man looked frail and weak, but it moved with great speed. I quickly and quietly moved to the back window and peered out as I saw it dig up the cat once again and hold it in its arms. It stroked the cat as if it were alive and quickly hurried around to the front of my house. Back at my front window again and watching it as it made its way to my mailbox and put the cat inside. And it disappeared back into the night. Now that day, huh, well, that day I didn't leave my house. I was too shocked by what had happened. I slept a bit then and then decided to take a trip to the store. And when I came back, I checked the mailbox again and there it was, the same cat I just buried. Now, I went to take the dead cat out of my mailbox once again and bury it in a completely different spot. Then, I stayed up again that night to see what would happen. A flashlight in hand and watching my front window again, I saw the long, spindly man come out of the field and jog into my yard to the spot where I just buried the cat that day, and it started to dig it up with his hands. I slid open the back sliding glass door and stepped outside, turned on the flashlight at the man, and yelled, What in the hell are you doing? The man turned around to face me, and that's when I saw the thing for the very first time. In plain sight that is. Its body looked like it had been mauled by a bear, clothes ripped, rotting skin shone through, its teeth completely exposed and jagged, and the eyes were sunken in. I quickly ran back inside as it gave a shrieking sound and hopped over in my direction. I slid the glass door shut and locked it and grabbed the pistol I bought for self-defense from under the couch. Sending a bullet into the chamber, I shined the light at the door and waited. I accidentally fired off a shot in fear when a glob of something smacked against the glass and slid down it. I walked to the glass door and shined the light down to see what it was. A mess of entrails were scattered across the bottom and blood smeared across the glass. Sick to my stomach, I choked back the vomit that was rising in my stomach. I quickly rushed back to the couch that was against the wall and sat there with my eyes fixed upon the glass door, my flashlight off. Outside, I could see the moonlight through the gruesome mess that was plastered upon the glass. I saw a figure approach the door, then its hand smeared the blood across the window, and I was frozen with fear, waiting for it to break the glass and then try to take my life from me. And after smearing the blood, it turned around and just, well, it walked away, and I swear I could hear a faint chuckle, like a smoker's lungs laugh, but more raspy. Well, I sat in the sofa, and I didn't budge. I don't know how long I waited, but after a while the room became light as the sun rose in the sky. 
I looked around the house, and everything was so quiet. Then, I fixed my eyes on the window, and smeared across it were handprints with very unusually long fingers and a smiley, just the same as the one on the letter. I sighed, tried to make myself comfortable, but I was still very alert. I laid down and rested my eyes. A few hours later, I awoke from a nightmare and propped myself up on the couch. I was, apparently, pissing whatever it was off, and I was getting more scared by the second just thinking of whatever was out there, lurking. I cleaned up the entrails off the ground and went out to check my mail. Then I came across the plain letter. Curious, I opened it up and felt a chill shoot down my spine. The letter had no words, only a smile, the same crude smile that was on the letter stapled to the cat and on my sliding glass door. I quickly crumbled it up and tossed it to the ground. I left that night. I went to stay with my parents up in the city for a few weeks, not explaining my situation to them. I just simply told them that I had been sick of the country life and needed a change for a few weeks. They happily agreed. When I returned to my home three weeks later, horror was stricken across my face, for my house was not as I left it. As soon as I walked in, the stench of rotting carcass hit my nostrils, and I vomited on the floor. Covering my nose with my shirt, I proceeded to the light switch. Turning on the light made me shriek in terror, because scattered throughout my house were entrails and carcasses of dead animals, and some were propped up like humans on my couch, and all were staring at me as I stood, horrified in the doorway. All over the white walls were smiley faces and the same writing over and over. I'm very angry with you, written in blood. I lifted up the couch seat to look for my pistol, but it was gone. I saw something in the hallway moving steadily back and forth. Flipping on the hall light, there it was again. The creature who had almost killed me the night before I had left. It snapped its gaze to me and moved its mouth into a sickening smile. It jumped up and started to walk in my direction. I quickly turned around and ran outside, slamming the door behind me. I got into my car, started it up, and proceeded to back out of the driveway and onto the road as fast as I could. And behind me, I saw a figure in my rearview mirror running up to my car. Its arms slammed into the trunk, and it proceeded to hop onto the roof of my car. I shifted into drive and slammed on the gas, and I drove all night as far as I could away from the house. Those dead animals and that thing. As soon as I made it to the city limits, I decided to stop and buy some gas. Seeing as I was almost on empty, I pulled into a gas station and got out of my car. And my eyes widened as I saw the trunk had been completely bashed in. I quickly pumped the gas and left for my parents' house. Well, four months later, I'm living in my apartment, dealing with the occasional nightmares at times but can never be happier to get away from that house and that monster that lives there. But, I just checked my mail this morning, and I received a letter with no return address. And inside, written on a crumpled up paper, 
was a crudely drawn smiley face, and the words, you can't hide, scribbled underneath it. As a child, I was a picky eater, like I assume most children are. As my parents tell it, my eating habits transcended normal childhood proclamations of I don't like broccoli, and evolved into a refusal to eat absolutely anything of substance. Things other children might eat and enjoy like chicken nuggets, spaghetti, or even a hot dog were shunned by toddler me. It got to the point, they say where they and my pediatrician became concerned for my health. I stopped growing properly, fallen well below the typical percentiles for children's height and weight, and the rest of my development seemed stunted as a result. Phrases were tossed around like failure to thrive and tube feed. In the end, my parents were forced to feed me my calorie-loaded milkshakes made with nutrient-enriched formula every night in a bid to get me to gain weight. Honestly, I don't know how they put up with it. I sound like I was a little shit. The milkshake regime extended past toddlerhood and into my childhood. At five years old, I was still refusing to eat food, despite the countless nights my parents sent me to bed hungry for refusing to even try my dinner. I was still small for my age and spent more than little time in the hospital due to the starvation of my body. My parents would later tell me that they were sure I was going to be taken away to the state because of how emaciated I appeared, thankfully. They were in constant contact with doctors who monitored the situation, so there was undeniable proof that my case wasn't due to neglect. At six years old, when I should have been starting school, I was still a very small kid. My body never received enough nutrients to properly grow, despite my forced feedings. And as a result, my speech and physical movements were stunted, leaving me a six-year-old that behaved more like a three-year-old. Again, I don't know how my parents coped. I can remember the day I discovered a food I actually liked. It was September 22, 1997. I was at the grocery store with my mother, sitting in the child seat of the cart because my frail legs couldn't handle walking for too long. My mother looked tired and weary, and I can remember staring at the deep lines that seemed etched in her face as she pushed the cart silently through the small store in an attempt to find something, anything, that would tempt me to eat. And then I saw it. A jar of jam. I tried jam before and hated it. The texture, the stickiness, the overwhelming sweetness. Vile. But this jar, it seemed different to my six-year-old mind. I pointed it out to my mother, my bony finger extended to the glass jar with the plain white label that read, Mrs. Wilson's Homemade Jam. What, sweetie? What do you see? My mother's voice was almost wary as her face and her eyes followed my outstretched hand. When her gaze landed on the jar, her head snapped back towards me like it was elasticated. You want that, Marky? The excitement in her voice was barely contained. You want to try that? I nodded my head. My mother grabbed the jar of jam off the shelf faster than I had ever seen her move before. She even smiled. I couldn't remember the last time I saw her do that. We paid for the jam and left the store without so much as bothering to shop for the rest of our groceries. Mother hurried me out to the car, excitedly strapped me into the seat before placing the jar of jam in the front almost reverently. This was the first time I was actually shown interest in food, and she was thrilled. The town I grew up in was small, populated by a mere 350 people. The drive from the grocery store to my house took under 5 minutes, really. We could have walked if I wasn't so frail. When we got home, Mother excitedly ushered me into the house with the jar of jam clenched tightly in her hand. Immediately, she sat me at the table, as if she were afraid I'd suddenly change my mind and refuse to try what I had picked out. But my mind and gaze were focused on that jar. 
It didn't look like the other jams I had tried. It didn't seem lumpy or thick, and there were no seeds. Something about it intrigued my dull little mind, though I can't explain what it was, even now. Here, Marky, you want to try this? My mother held out a spoon laden with jam. It was a deep red and seemed to glisten under the kitchen lighting. I remember taking the spoon carefully and raising it to my face, peering at it closely. Anxiously, my mother waited. Suddenly, my tongue darted out to taste it. I can't even describe to you what that first taste was like. Imagine the most amazing thing you've ever eaten, coupled with the most euphoric you've ever felt. And that would get you close to what the experience of tasting that jam was for me. I ate everything off the spoon in seconds and silently asked for more. My mother, with tears in her eyes, handed me another spoonful, which I lapped up eagerly. After my fifth spoonful, my mother was openly sobbing and dashing for the phone to call my father and tell him the wonderful news. Meanwhile, I remained entranced by the jam. As a child, I wouldn't have been able to describe the taste to you, my palate being limited as it was, but as an adult, I could tell you it's a deep, rich flavor, a combination of sweet and savory that was perfectly balanced. It didn't taste like strawberries or raspberries, but a combination of the two mixed with some sort of saltiness that seemed to heighten it. I suppose it's a lot like how some people like salted caramel, the combination of sweet and salty. It was pure bliss. My father stopped by the grocery store on his way home from work and bought another jar, and so, for the next two weeks, that became the only thing I ate. I would have jam for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, followed by my enhanced milkshakes in the evening. My parents were thrilled. They hoped that my sudden liking of this food would lead me to liking other foods as well. Then, one day, when mother and I went to the grocery store to buy more of my jam, we found the spot on the shelf where it usually sat empty. Mother, slightly panicked, rushed to the front of the store to ask the clerk if they had any more of Mrs. Wilson's homemade jam. Sorry, we're all out right now. My mother's face fell, and she threw a worried glance in my direction. When will you get more? The clerk scratched his head thoughtfully. Well, see, it's actually made by a local lady, Mrs. Wilson. She sold it to Hector to resell in the store. She said she only had so many jars available, and no one seemed to like it except for your boy there. I was beginning to grow irritable from being in the car and not having had my jam for lunch. My fussing drew mother's attention, and she stared at me worriedly. Is there any way I could get Mrs. Wilson's address or phone number? That jam is the only thing Mark will eat. Like is common in most towns, everyone knows the business of everyone else, so the clerk was aware of my parents' struggles in getting me to eat. He must have felt sympathetic toward my mother's sudden stress because he searched in the back office for the invoice that held Mrs. Wilson's address. That afternoon, Mother and I sought out the elusive jam maker. She lived in a cottage on the outskirts of town in a gingerbread-style house that would be described as idyllic nowadays. When Mother knocked on the door, a young woman answered. She was small with blonde hair in a tight bun and a sad face. Can I help you? Her voice was soft and, years later, Mother would tell me that there was something about Mrs. Wilson that was so dejected and forlorn, but desperation is a wonderful motivator and my mother wanted me to keep eating, so she pasted a smile on and explained the situation to the young woman at the door. Oh, that is so wonderful, Mrs. Wilson exclaimed, smiling for the first time since she came to the door. I am so happy he likes it. It's an old family recipe, and when Hector said it wasn't selling well, I thought maybe I'd messed up the batch. My mother asked if Mrs. Wilson had any more jam, and, with a smile, the woman retreated into her house and returned a moment later with a box. This is the last of it. I've kept a few jars myself, but since it seems so unpopular, I didn't think I was going to make another batch. 
This is amazing, my mother said, seeming to sag under the weight of the box and the relief she felt. I don't know what it is about this jam that he loves so much. Mrs. Wilson laughed. I'm just glad I didn't mess it up like I was thinking I had. My mother offered to pay the other woman, but she refused, saying that seeing someone enjoy her creation was payment enough. We left with a dozen jars. We managed to stretch those out for several months, though I hated having to ration my precious confection. One day, a few weeks after I had turned seven, we saw Mrs. Wilson in town. She waved a cheery greeting to my mother and waddled her way over, her round, protruding stomach making her slightly off balance. Congratulations! Mother exclaimed when they drew near. Mrs. Wilson thanked her and rubbed her stomach. I stood there wondering if she had any more jam to give me. I hadn't made any recently, she said in an answer to my brisk question, but maybe soon. I was annoyed, but resigned. My mother was just happy I was finally starting to act like a normal kid who ate and talked. So what if all I ate was jam, she thought. At least I was eating. A few more weeks passed and we ran out of jam. The grocery store no longer stocked it, so mother and I made a visit to Mrs. Wilson. When she answered the door, I noticed her stomach wasn't round anymore, and she, once again, looked sad. She invited us inside, the offer of jam having me run into the house before my mother had a chance to reply. I sat patiently at her round kitchen table while she spread jam onto slices of bread. My mother watched in earnest as I looked at the bread suspiciously before picking it up and nibbling it to my relief. The sweet and savory taste of the jam overpowered the bread taste and I greedily ate it down. My mother sagged in relief, seeing this as another victory in the battle of my eating habits. I ate several more pieces of bread with jam while Mrs. Wilson and mother talked. I ignored their conversation in favor of eating my treat, occasionally catching words like stillborn and devastated, but paying no mind. Before we left, my mother hugged Mrs. Wilson tightly. She didn't have any jam to give me that day, but promised me some soon. I left with a full belly in the anticipation of more of my sweet treat soon. For years, this pattern went on. Mother and Mrs. Wilson developed a sort of friendship when we would go to visit every few months. They would sit at Mrs. Wilson's kitchen table and talk while I ate jam. Eventually, Mother began putting the jam on other foods to see if I would eat them. I tried chicken, beef, bananas, and apples, all smothered in my delicious jam, and ate every bit. Mother and Father practically sobbed in relief. By the time I was 12, I was eating more foods but still relied on the jam. If it didn't have jam liberally coating it, then I wouldn't try it. That jam seemed to mask every other flavor and I used it like other people use ketchup or gravy. In this time, Mrs. Wilson seemed to age quickly, and her production of the jam slowed. She told me and mother that it was hard on her body making the jam. It was a long process and very labor intensive. I worried about the day when she might no longer make it for me, but she simply patted my head and told me that she'd make it as long as I wanted it. And I smiled. By the time I was 18, I was better with food, but still hated the taste and texture of it. Mrs. Wilson's jam was the only food I've ever actually liked or wanted to eat of my own accord, and she still supplied me with it. Her frequency of batches lessened to only once a year or more, but when I finally got those jars of the rich red goodness, I was thrilled. After high school was over, I moved away for college, but every time I returned home, I made sure to stop in and visit Mrs. Wilson. She seemed to grow lonely as she aged, and I often wondered where her husband was or if she even had one. When I asked what she did for work, she just said she was in the business of making people happy. I wasn't sure what that meant, but I figured it was something to do with her amazing jam. During my visits, we'd talk and catch up, and she would always send me home with jars of jam. I rationed those out back at university, where I was old enough to know that I needed to eat, but still stubborn enough to hate foods besides the jam. 
More years passed. Despite my unusual tendencies as a child, I grew into a rather successful and normal man. I work in data entry, which is boring as it sounds, and am married to a wonderful woman who, at first, was annoyed with my weird food habits, but came to accept that I just didn't like this stuff. Doesn't matter what it is, I just don't like food. I've never and likely will never eat food for the joy of it, unless we count jam, of course. My wife doesn't like it, but she's used to it now, I think. A few weeks ago, we returned home to visit my parents. As I've been doing for years, I made a point to visit Mrs. Wilson. She's older now, and the time has been unkind to her. Her body seems frail, as if it was carried heavy burdens for years, and she no longer stands up straight. But she still smiled when she saw me and smiled even wider when she met my wife. We had a very nice visit, her getting to know my wife and catching on what had been happening in my life. Just before I left, she gave me a box of jam. I'm afraid this is it, Mark, dear. Her voice sounded as frail as her body looked and for the first time, the idea that I could lose Mrs. Wilson popped into my head. Even though she was only in her 50s, she seemed much older. She'd been a part of my life for so long now, I couldn't imagine no longer being able to see her. I'm too old for making jam now, she said with a sigh. My body, it just won't allow it. These things happen. Best to leave it to the young ones. She smiled weakly, but I could tell she was sad. Tears pricked my eyes as I set the box of jam jars on the ground and wrapped her frail body in a tight hug. Thank you for sharing your jam with me. As long as you have, I said, then I kissed her forehead gently. Mrs. Wilson smiled and waved me and my wife off as we left. That was a few weeks ago, and uh, today I got a call from my mother. She was sobbing uncontrollably. It took me a long time to finally figure out what she was saying, and when she did, hell, I didn't even know what to think. I sat there at my kitchen table still in my pajamas and with a plate of jam and toast in front of me while my mother told me that Mrs. Wilson had passed away. It appeared she died several days ago but no one knew it until my mother went for her weekly visit and found the other woman slumped over in her chair and uh, unfortunately there was nothing they could do. It was too late. I stared at my jam toast and felt numb. but. That's not the worst of it, Mark. My mother sobbed. What? I asked. What, Mom? Oh, God, Mark. What they found, God. I'm so sorry. She broke down into incoherent sobbing again. Eventually, my father took the phone from her and explained what the police had found in Mrs. Wilson's house when they arrived. I'm still not sure what to think about it. Son? I hope you're sitting down for this, my father began. Um, no one knew. No one knew what a crazy, sick bitch she was. I swear. He cleared his throat and sounded like he was fighting back his own tears. I'm just sorry we fed you that shit for so long. My eyes immediately went to the jam. My precious jam. The police searched her house. In the cellar, they found the area where she made her jam. Jesus, son. It was kids. God damn it. It was kids. It was her... It was her own babies. Turns out, Mrs. Wilson's jam was homemade in a very literal sense. She had, a year before I first ever tried her jam, gotten pregnant and then miscarried at home. Apparently, it created some sort of mental break in her brain, and for God knows what reason, she decided to incorporate the baby, fetus, whatever, into her jam. She cooked it with the berries, strained it, and took care to make sure not to have any fragments in the final product. That's why it was always so perfectly clear and free of seeds. It was also why it took so long for her to make batches. After that first one, she decided to try again with the pregnancy and, when that too ended in a second trimester miscarriage, 
the jam. For over 20 years, Mrs. Wilson lived in a cycle of getting herself pregnant, which she apparently achieved by acting as a prostitute in the larger neighboring town, and then aborting the pregnancies at home sometime between the 12th and 20th week, when the ingredient was large enough to be made into a batch. That was why she only made one batch of jam a year, and why she appeared to age so quickly and harshly. Back-to-back -back pregnancies will do that to a woman. In the end, when she said her body could no longer support jam making, she was telling the truth. Women in their 50s don't often get pregnant, and Mrs. Wilson was no exception to that rule. My parents were horrified. For years, they had been feeding me this stuff. For years, they had been so gleefully shoveling this jam into my system, ignorant of the fact that it was made with human remains. They had been so thrilled when I had started eating normal food, so thrilled when six-year-old me had pointed to that jar of jam and then taken it so eagerly. My mother apologized profusely on the phone through her sobs. When the call ended, I looked down at the plate of jam toast in front of me, studying the deep red spreads with its flawlessly smooth consistency and the sweet and savory combination of it that had been the only food I had actually enjoyed in my life. Silently, I rose from my chair and went to the cellar where I stored my box of jams. Mrs. Wilson made 12 jars out of each batch, and I had learned to stretch that very carefully over the years. I still had 11 remaining. Carefully, I looked through the box, taking out each and every jar and inspecting it, as if trying to see the tiny particles of unborn children that had been cooked into each one. At the very bottom of the box, I found an envelope. I reached for it with a shaking hand pulling out the letter from Mrs. Wilson. It was short, not saying much, but I smiled to read it all the same. I've always had issues with food, I don't know why. Most children grew out of their picky eating, and to some extent I did too. I learned over time that I need food to live, though eating it brings me no joy and often makes me sick if I find a texture or taste I can't stand. Mrs. Wilson's jam saved me. It has been the first and only food I have ever liked, and the only one I willingly and gladly eat. And in that envelope that I found at the bottom of my last box of jars, the last batch Mrs. Wilson made, I found her legacy to me, something she wanted me to have before she died because, she said, I was the bright spot of her life and she had done this all for me. The sound of my wife moving upstairs manages to reach me in the basement. She's awake late because she's had a difficult time sleeping lately. Whistling to myself, I put the index card back into the envelope and leave my box of jam in the same place as before. Then I climb the stairs to the kitchen where I find my wife standing at the stove, scrambling eggs. She turns to me and smiles, her hair tousled from sleep and her face serene not yet twisted up in agony due to her morning sickness. She turns and kisses me and I feel the soft swell of her pregnant stomach against my body. Our last trip home had been a surprise to my parents with the pregnancy. She's 12 weeks now, so she says it's safe to tell people the news. Of course, my parents were thrilled, so was Mrs. Wilson, which is why I think she left me the recipe. I think if I push her hard enough, I might be able to get my wife to make some jam for me. My father, for as long as I can remember, had been a proud man and too self-assured for his own good. And he often told me, whenever I asked him for advice, that with pride you can do anything. 
and I guess this was his idea of motivation, but to me his arrogance was absurd. He had never accomplished anything in his life, and had lived in his brother's shadows since they were young. I had once, and only once, seen him smile, and that was after my uncle died. My father had always hated his brother, hated him for being rich, for being handsome, for marrying a beautiful woman who loved him. My father envied his brother and took great joy in his death. He never cried a single tear for him, sneering at those who did and denouncing them as weak. I saw him smile though, and he hid it well. It was almost impossible to see, but I saw it. His lips curling into a sadistic smirk, the slightest of chuckles coming from his dry, cracked lips. And I almost shuddered at the mere sight of it, but I restrained myself as I was paying my respects to my beloved uncle. It was shortly after my father's death we moved into the villa. It had been a parting gift from my uncle to my father, only to be given to him after his death. My father took this as his brother mocking him, as if even beyond the grave he was flaunting his success. My father, however, was a greedy man, so he accepted the villa and his share of my uncle's fortune, and we moved in weeks later. At the start, it was just me, him, and my sister. I loved my sister more than anything I had ever known, and would gladly die for her. But... I despised my father. He knew this, and in return he never made his preference of my sister over me anything less than absolutely clear. I was, after all, the remnant from his first marriage, a living memory kept only as long as necessary, to be cast aside as soon as possible. My father quickly grew accustomed to his new lifestyle. The life of the rich, as he said, was one he was always destined for, and he took great pride in his new home. There was never a day when he didn't clean everything, or get me and my sister to, and he used to make us listen for hours as he droned on and on about how proud he was to live in such luxury. Never once did he mention his brother, never once did he thank anyone but himself and he seemed to think that he had all earned all of this just by being himself. And I grew more and more hateful of him every day, but my sister remained blissfully unaware. And after a few years, my father took another wife, and then another, and then another, and then another. My father was a notorious womanizer, a gift from the gods, as he so put it. And let me be fair though, he was a handsome man, and to those who did not know him, his arrogance appeared as confidence. He just seemed to attract women, and the sudden increase in funds he had gained due to his brother's death definitely didn't hinder that. He seemed unaware of these women's true intentions, probably have never even considered that they were only dating him for his money, and in retrospect, not telling him about this was the worst decision I have ever made, but I doubt it would have made much difference in the end. His fourth wife, a blonde, of course my father always had a thing for blondes, named Clara. I'm not sure, actually. Her name isn't important. What is important, however, is that after my father had arrived home in a drunken stupor and struck her, she managed to successfully divorce and sue him. It was agreed that my father would pay her a lump sum for compensation, and due to this, he would need to sell the villa, having squandered his vast inheritance on failed business ventures and, eventually, alcohol. My father, of course, did not take the news well, and so he returned home that night, somewhat drunk. 
In fact, it would be safe to say that this was the drunkest I had ever seen my father. He was crying uncontrollably, switching between incredible anger and complete self-pity. My sister, being as kind and loving as she was, had tried to calm him. He had responded at first, staring quizzically at her, and then, the confusion passing, knocked her to the ground. He started to yell at her, driving her to tears, and it was all I could do to not attack him there and then. It became clear that after a while, that while he was yelling at my sister, he was clearly imagining her as his wife, not my sister. For example, she has blonde hair, and yet he referred to her as the Golden Devil more than once. And eventually, my father retired to bed, and I held my sister in my arms as she wept. The next day, my father was unusually quiet, even without taking his assault of my sister into account. He seemed strange, and I knew that his wife was coming to the house one final time that night to collect the last of her things. I had arranged for my sister and I to go out for the night to avoid any arguments the two would have. So, when it was seven at night, we left my father to his own devices. We had a good time on the town. We laughed and joked about her school, talked about the boys she liked, and had one extremely awkward conversation regarding my last girlfriend, Valerie. And then she decided she wanted to head home. I was reluctant to return, but she made her cute, pouty smile at me, and I gave in. But I shouldn't have given in. The first thing we noticed was the smell. It was repugnant, and it was especially strange considering that it was coming from our villa. My father had always kept it clean, so why did it suddenly smell so bad now? And we knocked on the front door. And when there was no answer, we walked in slowly. Normally, our father would have let us in. But this time, we had to use our own keys. After yelling for my father and getting no answer, I decided to head upstairs to look for him. And as soon as I stepped on the first step, I heard a whimper, almost inaudible. I stopped dead in my tracks, but forced myself to go on my sister immediately behind me. He was probably drunk again, just lying on the floor and weeping. I thought to myself, pitiful, but nothing out of the ordinary. We ascended up the stairs, and we heard no more whispers. Perhaps I had just imagined it. And I was getting paranoid, so we decided to check in our father's room just to be safe. We saw the blood almost immediately. It was, quite literally, everywhere. It seemed to have sprayed around as deliberately as possible, done so almost gracefully. In chunks of what I assume was an arm lay strewn across the floor, obviously not done with such care as the blood. There was an open suitcase on the ground, filled with beauty products and fancy clothes, and it was obvious who it belonged to and the long blonde hair scattered around the room did nothing to dissuade me. My sister screamed, and I was tempted to do so as well, but the sight of the detached head lying in the center of the room rendered me speechless. I was close to fainting, which was probably why I didn't do more in the moments to follow. Mere moments after we had entered the room, my father appeared, standing in the doorway, holding what looked to be a very sharp knife. His sleeves were stained with blood, and there was a strong stench of alcohol coming from him. He seemed to be barely aware of what he was doing, and yet he was crying. He lunged at us, wailing hysterically, frantically waving his knife around like he was trying to swat a fly, and I desperately tried to avoid him backing myself up against the corner, until I saw my sister standing there, oddly still, 
I barely had time to notice the blood trickle down her neck before she fell to the floor. My father, in his delirium, had once again mistaken her for his wife and had slit her throat while I was cowering. I screamed. No, no. It would be more accurate to describe as a roar. A primitive, desperate yell. The mix of fear, confusion, and complete sadness manifesting itself as rage. My father had done one, only one good thing his entire life. And he had thrown it away because of his selfishness and madness. And I screamed, I roared, and I sprang upon him. And I had never been a strong man, but I wrestled control of the knife easily enough, and he barely had time to realize what was happening before I drove it back down. And ten minutes later, I emerged from the house in a fresh set of clothes and took my sister to the hospital. She was dead, of course, but I wanted to try, even if futilely to save her. I was told there was nothing they could do, and that given the circumstances, I was lucky to have gotten away unharmed. This was little comfort, but I couldn't help but feel somewhat relieved. Even if she didn't live to see it, I had taken my revenge. I had not killed my father, but I imagine he probably would have preferred that. My father once told me that with pride you can do anything. Well, my father had pride to spare. So let's see if that's enough to save him with his fucking limbs severed. When I was a kid, I was a huge sucker for Barbie dolls. Really. I didn't care for them like other girls did. Giving them baths and cleaning them up and going to sleep with them. But I did like playing with them. I usually played around with the outfits. Having them talk to each other, you know, stuff like that. I possessed 15 dolls, 10 girls, two males, and three little kid Barbies, who were girls too. I even named the dolls after my family members, but among the fifteen, the doll named Samantha, who was named after me, was my favorite, merely because she had the fairest skin and the longest, blondest hair, none of which I had. I admit, that was pretty shallow, and bordering on sexist, of me. Apparently, I had a lot of fun with these dolls. I don't remember much, but I recalled having them play out scenarios that I wanted to happen to me. Like me getting noticed by my crush, or my brother finally getting caught eating all the cookies. It might sound lame now, but hey, you know, I was a kid. Anyway. My mom would always tell me, You're always inside your room playing with those things. You should get out there and make friends, honey. But I would ignore her. I would stay in my room, in my own little world, playing with my little plastic Mattel friends. It was heaven. Until the day I fell down the stairs. My head suffered some long-term memory loss when it hit the floor, so I couldn't remember most of my childhood after that, including, yes, the dolls. I remember having them and playing with them, but apart from what my mother recounted for me, it was all a big blur. My mom told me that I continued to play with my Barbie dolls, but it wasn't quite the same. Eventually, I grew up. When I reached about 10 years old, 
These dolls were all left in a box in the attic to gather dust. I wasn't too upset about it either. At that time, I had already moved on to reading Harry Potter books. One day, though, things were different. I had just finished high school, and I was packing up my things to head off for college. I needed to get some boxes from the attic, so I headed up the small spiral staircase and proceeded into the room. Going through the boxes, I found myself smiling, reminiscently, as I spotted some old stuff. Books, old toys, photo albums, and the like. I ended up staying there more than I had intended to. As I reached the last few boxes, I encountered the dolls. I opened up the box, only to be horrified by what I saw. For what I found, instead of my old friends, was a pile of plastic, naked bodies with no heads and arms. It wasn't that scary if you think about it, but it had surprised me completely since the last time I saw these dolls, which was when I put them in the box. They were all in perfect and sellable condition, and seeing them like that just tore a small hole in my heart. They had been dear to me somehow, after all. I headed down the stairs, the box in my arms, and showed the dolls to my mom. Did you let Stefan borrow these after we put them away? I asked. My brother had just turned ten this year, but I figured that he might have gotten his hands on my dolls years ago and made me thought they were chew toys or something. But then my mom frowned and looked through the box. No, I knew how much these dolls meant to you. I wouldn't do that. I shook my head. But he must have gotten his hands on them. Look, they're all messed up. I countered. My eyes were beginning to sting just looking at the bare bodies. But I cleared my throat and tried to pull myself together. They were just toys after all. But anyway, that's done now, nothing I can do. I'll put this back upstairs, I decided, grabbing the box once again and heading back into the attic. Part of me was still upset that Stephen might have gotten a hold of my things, but I managed to get over it when I reached the spiral stairs. Halfway there though, some force, probably my clumsiness, tripped me over and I fell down almost five steps. I landed on my rear on the wooden floor and I winced in pain as the dolls poured out of the box and onto my torso. I sighed as I got up. I'm alright, I yelled back downstairs. If you were asking. Getting the toys off me, I stood and took a moment to check myself up. Luckily, I didn't suffer any injuries. I got down on my knees and picked up the dolls, or at least what used to be the dolls, to put them all back into the box, until I noticed something odd. The dolls were naked and were missing some limbs, all except one doll, Samantha. She was in perfect condition, as she had always been, and was even wearing the outfit that I had always made her wear. A pink silk gown filled with glitters at the bottom part. She wore black stilettos and was carrying a black carry-on bag like she was going to a red carpet event. And she was smiling at me. I almost smiled back. That is, until I saw that her smile was different. Her grin was wide, almost abnormally wide and somewhat sinister. I felt chills in my spine. I headed back downstairs to tell my mom about it. She was still fixing some of my stuff for college and I approached her reluctantly. Mom? She barely looked up, but she gestured that I go on. Can I ask you something? She smiled. Well, you already have, honey. I rolled my eyes. This was not the first time to receive sassy talk from my mom. Let me ask you another, then. How did I get on with those dolls? 
She stopped what she was doing and looked at me, a slight frown in her eyebrows. What, honey? How, I mean, how did I really play with them? I asked more clearly. Her frown deepened. You mean before the... I nodded, referring to my childhood accident. Hmm. It was adorable how you played with them, really. She began, taking a breath. I listened intently as she told me about my having them all interact with each other. Like a role play of sorts. The scenarios I wanted to happen in real life. It sounded nothing serious, but for some reason I couldn't get this uneasiness away. Okay then, I gulped. And after the accident? Well, we let you stop playing with them because it was starting to scare your sister Chrissy. You started having them fight with each other, physically, and having them take off each other's body parts. You would take off their clothes, set them on fire, and you would take off their arms and throw them around in your room. And you would remove their heads and stomp on them with your foot while you laughed. You were enjoying it, Sam. She stopped, and I was glad she did. There was this one Barbie you left clean, though. The one in the pink dress, she said, going back to fixing my things. The uneasiness worsened. I knew that I had Samantha play me in all the scenarios. So, Samantha? Yes, yes, Samantha, she said with a nod. You would leave her clean, and then after that, you would whisper things to her. And it was just plain creepy. I guess I'm not really sure what to write down. These past few weeks feel, well, it's just hard to put into words what's going on. I could hear sirens in the distance. Not much time left now. The police will be here shortly. Only one more thing left to do. But first, I want to leave some kind of record. Some testament to what happened so when they look back on this insanity, maybe somebody will know I wasn't crazy. At least, <laughs> not completely. I'll write down the facts as they happened, try and give you a read on my mental state. My name is Chris. I'm 38. I got a decent job as a contractor, presently on my second marriage, or I was anyway. It feels so strange, putting everything in the past tense. My first wife left me for some college kid she met on vacation. It hit me pretty hard. Probably spent about three months at the bottom of a bottle. God damn, I was so fucking stupid. Thought that was the worst thing that could have happened to me. The banging is getting harder and I'm getting off topic. I'll start at the beginning of this twisted mess. Every year, I take my family up to the mountains at the onset of fall. My daughter, she always loved the trees when they changed. The reds, the yellows, the oranges, such beautiful colors. I remember thinking to myself how much the woods calmed her down after the divorce. We should move there someday, Daddy. Just you and me and we'll live here forever and ever. Memories. How random they are. How fragile of a thing it is. But I'm digressing again. It was on the way back when I noticed the change in my wife's attitude. Our girl was humming in the back seat and my wife 
just started snapping at her, telling her to shut her damn mouth. To be quiet, or she was going to kick her little ass out the car. I'd be putting it pretty mildly to say that I was shocked. I think I heard maybe about two or three swear words ever go past my wife's lips. Jesus, babe. What the hell's gotten into you? I asked her. Nothing. She shot back. Just drive the fucking car. There were a few muffled sobs from a confused little girl. But other than that, the entire two hour drive was in dead silence. I was too baffled to speak or turn on the radio. Here was a sweet, loving woman whose language never got stronger than a heck or a or dang who suddenly decided to start dropping f-bombs like it was going out of style. I tried to wrap my head around it. Vaguely, I recalled them not getting along. June so worried about being replaced by Lilith and vice versa. These things were bound to happen when single parents remarry. I pulled the car into the garage still racking my brain for something to say. Man of the house and all, the girls never gave me a chance. Soon as I cut the engine, they both flew into the house. I banged my head into the steering wheel and bemoaned my place as a lone man in an estrogen ocean. By the time I stepped inside, I heard both bedroom doors slam closed and two sets of small feet stomping around. No way, I wanted to deal with that right now. I hoped in vain that the whole situation would resolve itself and grabbed a bottle of Rebel Yell off the top of the fridge where I hide it. The first tug of bourbon is usually pretty rough, at least with the stuff I buy. Cheap and strong, that's how I like it. The following drinks go down smooth and warm you up the whole way down. I put three doubles away while I reviewed our trip in my head. We'd found a cave in the middle of the woods. One of those ones you have to climb down into. The opening was partially obscured by foliage, but it looked like someone had been in there recently. It was barely wide enough to squeeze myself down into, but my wife tugged me in. She had always been the more adventurous one in this relationship, I guess. The inside of the cave was pretty disappointing on account of how small it was. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. I don't much like caves, and this place had a discomforting vibe about it. Whole place smelled wrong. And there were all kinds of weird mushrooms and shit. Wait a sec, I thought to myself. The mushrooms. <laughs> the mushrooms, of course. The missus had slipped on moss when we were climbing out. And we had both taken a spill. She'd gotten a face full of fungus. And probably some kind of weird toxin. I don't know much about mushroomology or whatever. But at the time, I was betting on that being the case. The sun had gone down by the time I'd finished my drinking and contemplating. Sooner or later, I'd have to confront my girls. So it might as well be, while I've got a little bit of that Dutch courage in me. I trudged up the stairs and went into my daughter's room first. She was lying face down on the floor with her head tucked into her arms. I'll have to swing by Grammy and Pops to pick up your bed. I found myself saying, I've always been a fairly private person, keeping all my emotions in, so I'm fairly terrible at dealing with that kind of thing. Either that or maybe I'd gotten a secondhand dose of those spores and it mixed poorly with the alcohol. Mommy hates me. She pouted. She turned up her eyes at me, big as saucers and wet with tears. What did I do wrong? Ah, uh, nothing, sweetie, nothing. Mommy, 
Well, she just took a bump on her head this afternoon is all. She wrinkled her nose at my breath. You've been drinking again, Daddy. Eh, just a little pumpkin. Now, you get ready for bed and stop all this mom-hates-me stuff. She agreed, and I headed over to my bedroom, feeling better about myself. I could handle this. Popping a piece of gum to mask the booze, I walked in and flopped down on the bed. My wife rolled over to look at me. I was expecting a furrowed brow and some more harsh words, but to my relief, she kissed me gently. Sorry about earlier, she started, but I cut her off. I told her that I knew she didn't mean any of it and to forget about it. My lovely angel. She gave me a smile that would have melted the ice caps. Then she climbed on top of me and I thought we're all past it. How wrong I was. The door to our bedroom creaked open to reveal a tiny figure holding a steaming mug. The smile sharply downturned into a scowl and a loving gaze hardened into contempt. I rolled my love off me and sat up. <laughs> Bless her heart, my daughter had come in with some tea. She said it was so I didn't sleep in and miss work because I was drunk. It kind of went to shit from there. Neither one of them liked me drinking, the wife especially. She gave me an earful for a solid hour before I had enough and grabbed a blanket to sleep on the couch. Things deteriorated slowly. Every time I tried to talk to her about drinking, she pushed it off. Said I was free to do what made me happy, because she damn well would. Now, those words put me on edge. I wanted to know what she meant by that. And she tried to blow it off, like it just came out. I buried myself in work. We had just started laying foundation in the new development, so there was a lot for me to do. When I wasn't in the trailer, I was out with my guys putting up frames and laying in pipe. Some of the boys noticed I was distracted and began asking me questions about it. I avoided the questions as much as possible, never liked talking about that stuff. Eventually, all their prying got to me, and I opened up a little bit to the ones who had been around the longest. And I gotta say, it totally <laughs> did not help. The opposite in fact, as I was more stressed out than when I left home. Not many of the guys knew I was married and I didn't wear the ring at work. Uh, for practicality. That comes from being a private person. I don't think any of them knew I had a daughter though, and that was weird because some of them had been to the wedding. Then they start asking these bizarre questions. Who's Lilith? They want to know. They think I'm worried my wife is cheating on me because I'm cheating on her and I almost lost it on them. I want to show them a picture, but the last picture of me is from high school graduation. I think I'm cracking up, so I left early that day. I came home after driving aimlessly and found another cup of tea and a note written in a child's hand. It helps take the edge off just long enough for me to read the note. Daddy, I had a good day and I hope you have a good day now. I thought you were having a bad day because all the noise in you and mom's room. My blood pressure must have skyrocketed so fast I'm lucky I didn't have an embolism. Then I noticed a man's sock laying on the ground near the stairs. Immediately my jaw clenched, fairly certain I cracked a tooth from the pressure. Closer examination revealed it to be one of my socks, or at least the same brand anyway. 
I asked my wife about it when she got home. Later than usual, I thought, but she insisted she always came home at 8. She thought she must have dropped it when she was doing laundry. I called bullshit. Our washroom is upstairs next to the bedroom. No way that could have happened. Then I bring up the note, and she blows up. She said that we don't even have a daughter together, and she's trying to push her out of the picture. Right about then is when I slapped her in the face. Hand to God, hand to God. First time I ever laid hands on a woman, but I was crossing a line. Afterwards, when I looked into her eyes, I didn't see pain or shock or anything they always show in the movies. Well, I mean, I did at first. I had to blink, make sure my eyes were clear. But what I saw, looked, well, I don't know. Her face was so full of barely contained rage and hatred and violence. It was like I had broken through a thin layer of obsidian, covering, boiling magma, piercing some kind of veil. I shook the unease off later that evening with a fifth of rebel yell and a couple of Percocets. This was our life for about two weeks. Every day was more of the same, though Lilith and June's fights continued to grow worse. It got harder for me to tell my daughter that her mother didn't hate her. She spent most of her time drawing pictures of me and her walking through the woods by her cabin. Wasn't the first time we went, just the two of us. The most fun I'd ever had? I wanted to say yes. It was on the tip of my tongue, but it seemed so far away, a lifetime ago. Wasn't I happier with both of my girls in my life? At the time, it was impossible to say. Between the booze and the pills and the whatever the hell else, call it stress, I had a hard time keeping facts straight. The whole time, it felt like I was in a dim haze, and telling right from right was getting difficult, if you know what I mean. I called my friend and KC, while I was towing the line between buzzed and drunk on one of my more sober days. She had gone down to South America to look for chupacabras or something. She was all about that conspiracy crap Roswell bullshit. Always traveled around looking to prove that some made up animal was real. God only knows how she pays for that. We started off making small talk because I really didn't know how to explain what was going on. But KC was a good friend, one of the few people I confided in, so I just sucked it up and ran over the whole situation. At first, I thought the call got dropped. She was so quiet on the other end. She forced a couple of uncomfortable laughs until I got towards the end. When I told her about how my employees had acted, she stopped me, started asking wacky questions. What was my first memory of Lilith? Of June? Honestly, I, I didn't know. Couldn't think through the haze. Which one I liked better? And did I think that one or both was manipulating the other? What about other people? How long had I been drinking and how much? Anxiety watch. Anxiety washed over me and I told her I was sorry to bother her. KC told me she'd be on the next flight back and urged me to do what? I'll never know. My wife killed the call. The next thing I knew, she is screaming at me about she knew it. She knew it, the way I'd been acting lately, all the late hours, and now a phone call to a woman who says she is flying in first thing in the morning. Sounded bad, yes, but she had a lot to answer for as well. Plus, she knew KC, had known her since junior high. 
She stormed off and I needed a fucking drink. Fortunately, the she-witch had gone upstairs and not into the kitchen. I reached up to my hiding spot on the fridge and grab a fresh fifth, but my fingers found nothing. The night prior, I hadn't gotten too wasted. There had to be something up there. I kept probing until I found a note from my daughter. Daddy, please stop drinking. I hate when you and mommy fight. <laughs> so precious, my little girl. I kept reading. I think when you and mommy fight is when the mean men come over. They aren't very nice to me and I think they hurt mommy because she is always yelling and screaming. I stayed at the trailer at work last night. The only reason I even woke up is because I passed out at my desk and the phone went off. Today was the day that Casey was supposed to come over. She showed up at the house and obviously I wasn't there so she started calling around. Originally, I was going to tell her to fuck off. I was too impaired to drive. But there was a tremor in her voice. She didn't feel safe and wanted me to get there as soon as possible. The fear saturating her voice motivated me to get in my truck and floor it back home. I don't know how. I didn't get a ticket. There were two cars in my driveway. One was Casey's, but I didn't know about the other one. I had a good fucking idea though, or I thought I did. I grabbed my tool belt out of the back, pulling a claw hammer out. The solid steel head felt so heavy, heavier than it ever had. I completely forgot KC and eased the front door open, being as stealthy as possible. Each step, I crept up. I could hear muffled voices getting louder and louder and louder. The unmistakable sounds of sex consumed my world as my grip tightened on the hammer. I'm man enough to admit that tears were clouding my eyes as I closed in on the bedroom I once shared with a loving wife. Sirens are getting real close now. Figures they'd have had back up. I have to hurry. Nothing could have really prepared me for what I saw when I opened that door. Secretly, I had hoped that they'd hear me and stop. Attempt to hide it. Something. Anything. Instead, I saw my beautiful wife, my loving spouse, my fucking wife, bent over on the bed getting slammed in the ass by an older man with a shaved head while a younger guy shot a load onto her face. Money shot. Perfect timing, Chris. Then. She smiled at me with her semen-covered face, and I reacted. Poorly. The first blow struck the guy before he could turn around. He staggered forward, grasping at the back of his head in disbelief. I swung again, and I'm pretty sure that broke some of his fingers. They always talk about hearing a crunch sound when the bones break in those detective books, but all I could hear was a faint, hollow ringing as the third strike punched into his skull, making a neat little crater of blood and brain. His body tackled me, but I've been working construction for 20 years. I threw him off easy enough and did a sort of desperate backswing before he could recover and come at me again. He was yelling for me to come back up, but it was too late. The claw hit him in the cheek, and I guess this was the adrenaline because I watched it in slow motion scrape up from his cheek and deform the jelly of his eye. I didn't hesitate, throwing all of my weight onto it and driving it in as far as it would go. 
He made such an awful screaming, and it only got worse when I wrenched the hammer around. I pulled down with all my might just like removing a tough nail, took a good chunk of his skull out along with some brain matter and unidentified bits of his body. Both of them were still alive but incapacitated. I smashed their genitals into nothingness, then gave them each enough solid wax to spill their brains into the carpet. Then, I turned to my wife. I, oh God, it was slow. I had wanted to kill those two assholes for taking what was mine, coming into my house and defiling my marriage. But I wanted to hurt her for doing this to me. Again. I won't put down the details, I refuse. You could read them in the fucking coroner's report if you want to get your rocks off to that kind of thing. Her body was sprawled out before me, twisted into an unnatural pose as she twitched and gurgled through her broken teeth. The hammer slipped out of my hand and I sat down on the blood-stained bed, debating what I was going to do next. Something in the corner of the room caught my eye. It was the walk-in closet. I've never liked such things, but my wife insisted. Specifically, it was the ajar door and corpse inside that caught my attention. I stood up on shaky legs and stumbled over to Casey's body. Steak knives. Mine by the looks, studded her chest like some kind of sick modern art display. She had been wearing a state hoodie, now violently shredded and soaked with blood. Her mouth was frozen open in shock. There was a torn photocopy in her hand. I skimmed through it. The article was from one of those wonky books that she had always been reading on the paranormal or supernatural or whatever. It talked about leeches. Not the ones you find in a pond and have to salt off. These were beings that used pheromones and trickery to manipulate the memory and perception of its victims. The article mentioned that they would slip in Native American hunting bands implanting false memories of being there. Everyone in the party would swear up and down to their tribe that this person had belonged to the village since birth. Casey had highlighted a couple of things. Opposite sex works best. Same sex can sense wrongness. Tries to isolate victims and lure them to feeding grounds. Slow metabolism only hunts once or twice a season uses herbs to enhance natural neurochemical controllers. Alcohol counters susceptibility to suggestion. And finally, a frantically scribbled message. Chris, please, you never believe me, but you are being fooled. It knows I know. Please warn somebody, then get far away. Please, Please try and remember. Think, Chris. Please, break through. Ruth was sterile. June D. And it cut off. Ruth, my first wife. Sterile. Couldn't be right. We had a daughter. I looked down at the shattered body of my beloved June. She had quit moving, though blood still continued to pool. Her body shifted, rippled. She was naked. She was clothed. She was angry. She was concerned. She was a whore. She was my wife. And those men were...
police. They had not been making a cuck hold of me, but investigating a body found in my closet by my wife, desperate to know why her husband had become a drunken pill popper. You idiot, Chris. That cop wasn't telling you to back up. He was calling for it. Bile pulled in my throat, then ejected from my mouth. Tears poured from my face as I clutched June's body. Heat escaped so quickly. Already, she was cool to the touch. I threw up again. There was no forgiving this. I plucked the revolver out of the cop's belt and put it to my temple before I heard an angelic voice calling me. My sweet Lilith. I trudged down the stairs, numbly swinging the revolver. She was in the dining room, setting the table for dinner. She even set out flowers in a crystal vase. There were two plates, two glasses, and two sets of silverware. Lilith looked at me with those big, beautiful blue eyes and told me in a sing-song that dinner was almost ready and I wanted to pack tonight. Then we could move to the mountains tomorrow and be far away from anyone who wanted to hurt us ever again. She just had to get the turkey out of the oven. Sounded tempting. I kicked her into the open oven without a word and locked the door. There were chains in the truck, so I have chained it shut and padlocked it. Dial's been set to 475 degrees. I figure the cops have something to cut the locks, but hopefully it'll buy enough time to roast that bitch well done. She's a tough one, still banging on the door even as I'm writing this. I don't know if the oven's going to hold much longer. I've still got this 38 Smith & Wesson, and the hammer too. I could hear the cops kicking in the door now. Screaming stopped. No sound from the oven. I think everything's gonna be okay. The preceding statement was recovered from the home of Christopher and June Beauchamp on November 28, 1986. Authorities responded to a reported officer down, engaged, and killed Mr. Beauchamp in a short gun battle when he opened fire on a patrolman attempting to break open his stove oven. The upstairs master bedroom contained the bodies of Mrs. Beauchamp, officers Fred Brady and Victor Carswell, and Miss Kimberly Malone. All the bodies had been savagely attacked, with Mrs. Beauchamp and Officer Brady and Carswell suffering repeated blunt force trauma to the head, chest, hands, groin, and knees. Miss Malone's body had been partially cannibalized. The statement from Lilith Beauchamp indicates that her father had forced her to consume part of the body like an animal before attempting to immolate her in his oven. Presently, Lilith has been adopted by Officer Raymond Estrada, who was wounded in the attempt to rescue her. Update. Officer and Mrs. Raymond Estrada have gone missing with their daughter Lilith. The Estradas were last seen in the vicinity of the mountains, May 19, 1987. If you have any information regarding their whereabouts, please contact the local authorities. Appropriate. It says this in the rules, under the FAQ, word for word. Submissions are supposed to be creepy stories to spread around the internet for a bit of an adrenaline rush on those late nights alone. They're not real. They're not meant to be full of explicit 
gore or violence. There have always been simple stories, sometimes overdone, sometimes with plenty of cliches or plot holes, but never, never truly chilling to the bone. Well, not before that night. As most of you probably know, creepypasta.org receives plenty of submissions. I'd started reading over submissions, deciding to help out after becoming a member. It was much harder than I had expected, to be honest. Most of the submissions I turned down didn't cross my mind even once after they had been rejected. Most violators followed a similar pattern. Blatant, crappy pastas. Grammatical errors far too frequent to ignore. Rewrites of previous pastas that had been done time and time again. Now, I'm quite the horror fanatic. I love movies, games, stories, anything with a macabre theme that would send chills down the spine. Unfortunately, being such a frequenter of these sites and sources resulted in sort of a um, immunity to the creepy. Reading through submissions never really made me glance over my shoulder or peer into dark crevices. Not like it used to anyway, though. I got cocky. Thought that nothing could scare me. That I was invisible to the supposed creep factor. I was stupid. It was late. My roommate was exhausted after studying for some class, so she had turned in for the night. My cat had been fed and was lounging in the other room, probably dozing off for the moment. Millie only ever got up to run around after I had gone to bed, finding that the most inconvenient time for me must have been the most fun for her. With no homework on my agenda and no work the next day, I tried to filter through as many of the submissions as I could, hoping for something new and exciting. Eventually, I got through rather quickly, rating each one and moving on. Shock Factor was next on my list. A submission from a user named Submission Filler. I wouldn't be contacting whoever this was, this seemed like a one-time thing. Regardless, I started reading through, almost bored at first as they seemed to go with the cliché setting of being alone on a dark, stormy night. Nothing stood out. At least, not at first. But I kept reading. Maybe they'd surprise me, I thought. God, I wish they hadn't. As I kept reading, the story warped into some twisted torture flick. Apparently, the protagonist wasn't completely alone. He had someone tied down in the other room. The narration quickly slipped into a step-by-step -step account of a horrific dissection, without any anesthesia, on some complete stranger. The part that sent the shiver up my spine was the descriptiveness. It seemed so detailed and so involved. It was like nothing that I had ever read before, blunt and all too natural. I rejected it, of course, it violated the rules. The username looked fake. I simply discarded it with the others and moved on. It stuck, of course. It had disturbed me a great deal, but I brushed this off as just being a good narrative. If that submission had fallen within the rules, it might have made a good addition. A couple of days went by, and at first I had forgotten all about shock factor. Eventually, I decided to look through the submissions again, and again. I went through the stories and rejected whatever didn't follow the FAQ. And honestly, you'd think that some of these people hadn't even given the link a quick gloss over. And it showed up. Again. Shock Factor. 
part two. Did this person honestly expect a part two to be submitted when his first had been rejected? I felt kind of pissed off thinking that this person had just resubmitted their works and even a little bit nervous as I remembered just how graphic the last one had been. Regardless, I opened the submission and started to skim through. I was disgusted as I found that the narrator was up to his old tricks, this time with the younger victim, stating as being somewhere around 15 years old. I didn't bother reading through the whole thing as it somehow managed to disturb me more than the last one. Detailed accounts of torture and abuse far beyond what I ever wanted to read in my life. All the while, it had that extremely real feel to it. That tone that dragged me in and made me believe that this was some actual legitimate account for a brief moment rather than some sicko's idea of a joke. A joke. A sick joke to play on the staff for rejecting his first story. That's what this must have been. It was discarded and I didn't volunteer to help anymore after that. For a short while I thought it was over and went back to my normal everyday life. Classes, work, boyfriend, classes, work, boyfriend, classes. I began to slip back into my schedule, though memories of the Shock Factor series kept bubbling up over the next week or so. I assured myself that it was over. Until I received an email titled Shock Factor Part 3 to my personal email address. It was impossible. There was no way that this guy could have gotten my personal email. I was unnerved, to say the least, by the fact that he found me. I tried to think of every possible logical explanation, even getting upset as I considered that my roommate had planned some elaborate prank to disprove my boasting over never being creeped out. After sending her an annoying text, I received a new one, this time titled Shock Factor Part 3. You should read it this time. My blood ran cold. How the... I looked at the description nervously, the glimpse of a message any Gmail user would be familiar with seeing located next to the message title. This time, there's a cat, and I know you love. It read, trailing off. I exited the tab and closed my computer, on some sort of god-awful suspicion. I suddenly stood up and began searching the apartment for Millie. I called for her, looking under the furniture. I even asked my roommate about her, and she was nowhere. I started to panic, convincing myself that whatever this anonymous sender was, they had somehow managed to get their hands on something close to mine, my pet, out of my house, as the topic of one of his twisted stories. How else could he have known that I had a cat? How could he have known my email address, and who the hell was he? Months went by. I graduated. I moved on in life. I got a job. I never did find Millie after that. Never did find out who was emailing me. My old roommate assures me that she knew nothing about it. Occasionally, I'd still get these strange emails even after changing over to a new address. New additions to the Shock Factor series, every time with a short description. The worst part is that every time I receive a submission, it seems to happen just after I lose something. And 
whatever I lose ends up in the story. I'll misplace a sewing kit and find Shock Factor Part 6, Stitching. Or I'll lose a pair of scissors and receive Shock Factor Part 9, Cutting Up. It scares me now. I dread checking my email and I'm paranoid. I never go out alone. It's putting a lot of strain on me and my boyfriend. I make him go everywhere with me except to work. The Shock Factor series has worked its way to part 23 at this point. I don't know how much more of this I can take. If you ever see a submission from Submission Filler, an email titled Shock Factor, or from the address submission.spacefiller, anything of the sort, please ignore it. For your own sake, ignore it. I don't know if that would even work. Hm. It's driving me crazy and I can't go anywhere alone. I feel like someone is following me. Like this stranger knows everything that goes on in my life. I don't know how his stories got so realistic either, but I don't want to think about it. I just got a text the other day, too. One that has driven me to the point of seeking legal help. I'm going to the police now. He has my phone number, and he's not going to stay out of sight forever. Part 30 will feature a guest star. I'm afraid that I'll have to move on to finding a new editor after she has her episode, though. How unfortunate. I knew her so well. Creepy ghost stories? Nah. We don't have anything like that around here. We do have the story of Jacob, but that's about as close as you'll get. You really want to know? Well, I'm not supposed to tell you, but alright. Just no interrupting. I don't have the patience for it. How to describe Jacob Emery? Well, I guess you could say he was the kind of guy you could never take notice of. This isn't to say he was a bad kid in any sense. Maybe people in this town thought he was the most reliable person for an odd job in the state, but he never really excelled in anything. He was the living proof behind the statement, Jack of all trades, ace of none. Most of this was due to his own lack of will. He dabbed in damn near everything this town could offer him. Automobiles, radio operation, store management, you know, what have you, but he never stuck with anything. His friends and workers went after him about it a number of times, but everybody got the same unsatisfying response. It just wasn't enough. Needless to say, any friends he kept were either very patient or never spoke of the matter altogether. It was probably inevitable then that Jacob would leave to go abroad. I don't remember where he went, but I think Gertrude down the street knew before she passed on. You'll have to scout someone else if you ever get curious. In any case, no one even tried to stop him. Everybody thought that a little travel would stamp the ambition out of him or else feed it until it was no longer an issue. Hell, we even gave him a sending off party, which I thought was pretty nice of everybody. So, anyway, he was gone for, I don't know, six, seven years, I can't remember. You'll have to check with somebody else about that too. Anyways, he came back eventually and he had changed, obviously enough. 
He was amiable, energetic, all smiles all the time. And we all quickly learned why. He showed us a souvenir. He brought back a solid black stick. The length of a pencil, but the texture of chalk. We all wondered why on earth such a simple thing would prompt such a spring in his step until he gave his demonstration. He took a piece of paper, and with this stick, oh God, there's got to be a better word for it with this stick, <laughs> he, he drew a crude circle. It dropped and rested on the border of the paper like a stone. It didn't leave the paper, but it acted out on it, sort of like an old movie projector on a screen. Son, I know how crazy that sounds, and if you feel like playing skeptic, then you can leave an old man to his craziness, but I know what I saw. Even if everyone's been hushing it up, and that stone he drew dropped. Jake even passed around the paper, and as it was being passed, it rolled around as the paper got tilted. None of us had any words for it. Hell, what was there to say? But he continued drawing, demonstration after demonstration for us, stick figures in various pageants and plays, doing everything from fighting each other to making perfect human pyramids, and we all thought it was incredible. That was all the go-ahead he needed. He announced that he planned to put on shows to pay for rent and food, where he would draw anything the crowd members wanted, that he talked to some length about and eventually convinced us that it would be safe. His drawings ethical, the practice lucrative and unique, and the attention would not go anywhere outside of the town's borders. Poor Jacob. If I'd not been so swept up in the moment, I might have read the signs right then and there and saved the sorry son of a bitch from snapping the terrible thing in half. But I was younger, and well, we all were, and we saw no problem with encouraging him what we all saw as an incredible experience to be shared with everyone else. Now, he didn't have any big radio or television connections, mind you, and the internet wouldn't come around for another decade, so he did what all people on a shoestring budget do. He advertised his show with flyers. Now, flyers might not mean anything to you city folk, but in a small town they gain a fair glance over from time to time, and what's more, Jacobs managed to stick out by having little figures jump up and down and whatnot to get people's attention. His first show must have gotten nearly 60 or so people, probably a lot more than that. And his shows were fantastic. Someone would shout out a scene from a play or a comedy sketch, and Jake's hand would fly over a white wall like a bird. He'd been holding back when he made that stone. That's for damn sure. His illustrations were all spot on, and he could make an incredible human figure in minutes. Come to think of it, I don't remember any of his scenes lasting more than 10 minutes to make. They were all really well done scenes. Not only could you see a knight charge a castle, Jake would draw the castle's interior as well, like a wedding cake split down the middle. You could see the knight scale the walls, fight his way through levels to the dungeon, fight back out with the princess, and make a leaping jump off the castle onto his getaway horse, all in complete silence. Not realistic? Nah. But that was part of the appeal. None of us went in there expecting something real. When a scene or sketch was finished, either the characters would leave off a wall, or he'd cover the wall with white paint. This was good in a way. It gave those shows a time limit, 
so that when he'd finished with all of the four walls in the room, everyone knew the show was over until the paint dried. Jake, meanwhile, was changing in a bad way. I'd mentioned that upon his return, he'd been extremely energetic. Well, that energy, that vitality or fervor or whatever you want to call it, it never left him. Not for an instant. Far from it. It seemed to grow in him and he enjoyed it all too much. His eyes grew wider. He slept gradually less over time his statements and opinions more radical and frenzied, and though he never was a pushover, he was starting to make people nervous in his company. A month or two passed, and Jake's audience grew like a wildfire. Nearly everyone in the town paid to see Jake's art in action, and he had to rent out larger and larger places for them to sit. He now didn't stop after one scene was done. He moved directly on to the next, put on the next blank space on the wall, sometimes to the intriguing effect of causing scenes to mingle, which the crowd loved. The subject matter got more wild and immoral. The monsters got more bizarre and creative, the fighters using more impossible weaponry all for the sake of the crowd's interests. Jake got steadily more indulgent, which we figured was from the money, and he became a drinker and a womanizer, neither of which got rid of that vitality, by the way. Some of those women claimed that they'd woken up in the middle of the night to see him scribbling with that stick on a drawing pad, a gigantic grin on his face. And while most of them said that they'd assume he was drawing them in the nude, there's rumors that one or two of them got glances at that notepad. Those anonymous few supposedly said that those drawings absolutely weren't nude pictures, but neither of them, whoever they are, will say what he was drawing. Don't bother looking for the notepads or flyers though, they're all gone now. Um, I'm getting off track. Point is, he was hitting the bottle, and that's important because it was that drinking that would eventually ruin everything. On the night of one of his performances, as he walked in front of his cheering crowd, it was immediately apparent to everybody that he was completely drunk. I was in the front row and I could smell the bourbon on him from 10 feet away. The show started. He went through a bunch of sketches and scenarios the crowd recommended. When at the end, someone asked him that he draw himself. Everyone cheered the idea. I guess they'd been wondering what his creations thought of him. And he eventually obliged. No sooner had Jake finished connecting the final two lines on his coat than every single character across the vast, expansive wall all stopped and looked directly at that illustration. Lovers stopped kissing, clowns stopped laughing, robots stopped fighting, pirates, everything stopped and looked at the Jacob illustration. The crowd died almost instantly. I remember Jake's face at that moment, pale white, full of terrible comprehension at his mistake and looking desperately for the cans of white paint he'd forgotten to put out before the show. Everyone else, they were looking at the fake Jacob. That Jacob reached into his jacket pocket, pulled out a black stick of his own, and as we all watched, drew a door. He pushed on his side, and the door swung open, allowing him to walk through into the floor of the auditorium. The rest was an absolute hellish pandemonium. 
People screamed and ran for the exits as Jacob's character, both those currently on the wall and whose which had previously left before being covered up, ran out their own exit, throwing pies, shooting lasers, blowing fire and poisoned and the impossible. I was near enough the exit to escape and gave only one backwards glance. The scene will haunt me forever. Jacob Emery was being dragged by his creations, kicking and screaming through the door his copy had made. The auditorium burned down, obviously enough, but I have no idea how many characters escaped, what happened to the fake Emery, or how many people died. The fire brought the fire department from the nearest cities up to over a hundred miles away. They in turn brought the police force, which brought the government, which hushed everything up. They took the flyers and any art Jake had made and swore everyone to secrecy or else life detainment. The fire was blamed on a cigarette in the garbage during a basketball game and we all eventually went on with our lives. Jacob was made to never have existed. You know, in retrospect, I realize everything. Jacob hadn't been creating illustrations. Illustrations don't move, much less act or attack. They're just images people see. Shadows made to look like real things. Jacob had been making life, actual thinking things in some alternate dimension, using a power that was never meant to fall to mortal hands. He got drunk on his power. His punishment was probably well deserved. Incidentally, the government screwed up on two different accounts. They did a damn good job silencing everyone, but... <laughs> proof remains. The ruins are still there, you know. The auditorium's ruins? I hear they're going to start reconstruction soon, which will wipe out any remaining evidence someone can definitely see. But I went back there once, several years after the fire, and just once. Amidst the rubble, covered in ash, I saw something squirming. I looked closer. It was Jacob Emery's hand on the wall, exactly like it had been three years ago. Sweaty, but callous, I remember. But it was constantly flailing, as if the body it was supposed to be attached to was still writhing in flames. That was mistake number one. Number two was those creations. Like I said, I don't know how many escaped, nor how many the government agents found and caught, but I will say this. Those tall grass meadows on the outskirts of town, don't go into them, ever. You were asking about those white figures you've seen at night, right? Well, this town doesn't have ghost stories.